Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Home of the Ice Age Floods A to Z live stream series, home of Central Washington University, and yes, home to Vinman's Bakery in beautiful downtown Ellensburg, Washington. You've got to love it. Jeff from Vinman's Bakery just dropped this off a few minutes ago. Jeff from Vinman's Bakery says, I love you. Did you really say that? Not really, but Jeff from Vinman's Bakery loves you, and so do I. Welcome to this episode, Session Y, called Many Missoula Floods, the local time. It is 11.46 a.m., and it's a Thursday, the day after Valentine's Day, Thursday, February 15th, 2024. Happy Valentine's Day, a day late. And you're like, oh, interesting choice, red, huh? Red shirt and red heart made out of bread. And Jeff's like, don't eat that, don't eat that. They put some special whatever on it. And I'm like, okay, I won't eat it. Thank you, Jeff, and the specialty bakers at Vinman's Bakery for the gift. And you're like, oh, so this is just stage two all day today? You got the red shirt on, red everything? Well, not quite. Vinman's Bakery also brought blueberry scones. Stage six scones. So we have blue and red properly represented here at Ice Age Floods A to Z headquarters. Ned Zinger in command. There have been other visits, believe it or not, which we will save for a little bit. Where are you viewing the from? I saw some five by fives. Thank you for the report. That always very, very helpful. Where are you viewing from today? Can I say hi to a number of you? We'll check our stations. Give you a shout. Oh, I'll give you a shout out the window right now. So there's uh, it's wet and it's wet because we had snow overnight, but the snow is not lasting long. 33 degrees Fahrenheit. So we had maybe an inch of snow, but it's mostly gone by now. Vancouver, Washington, sunny San Diego, California, Old Town, Idaho, that's Karen, Marion, Virginia, Fabian, Alberta, Boone, North Carolina, Grantville, Georgia. I'm trying to grab names I haven't seen but much before. We'll see if I'm successful. Michaels and Janesville, Wisconsin, Portugal, uh, that's on Anna Rita, Georgia, Marysville, Washington, Fairwood, Washington, Newman Lake, Washington, hello, John. Hood River, Oregon, Auburn, Washington, Wyndham, Minnesota, Darrington, that's backcountry Gary. Hello, Gary. Got an email coming for you. Got some juicy gossip to share with you. Kingman, Arizona, Billy in Spokane, Rick's in Costa Rica, T Rock is checking in from Mesa, Arizona, in the greater uh, Phoenix area. The snow's gone in Kennewick, Washington, everybody. Can I ask one more time, are we doing okay? I'm so confident now with the technology, I don't think I need to ask, but I guess I just did. Uh, Paul's in Mellon Valley, Idaho. I don't know where that is, Paul. Interesting. Uh, oh, Mellon Gravels. Is that a joke? Uh, Redmond, Washington. Hubbard, Oregon. Lots of Pacific Northwest. Makes sense. This is so Northwest Pacific, um, Pacific Northwest uh, centric that uh, that's good. Five by five. Thank you. Uh, Tasmania, that's Tezza, hello, and uh, Canute, and so on, LaPorte, Minnesota, okay, let's check the stations real quick, there's a tech, uh, I don't know if I'm going to tell you the tech story or not, anyway, uh, so here's the uh, slides and everything, and uh, we're good there, and here's uh, Docky, the document camera, I don't have to tell you anymore, right, we're, we're done, we're, come on man, we're done. We're done. There's only one more show. Richard Waite today and Jerome Lessman, Sky Cooley, and Joel Gombiner on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. So I don't think I even need to show that to you again. 
There's the zoom window, looks about the same. There's the shelf cam once, once again. There's the corner or the window cam once again. Okay, iPad's working, Docky's working. It's been a busy morning, and I will I will weave the uh, morning's activities into today's show, unless I totally forget something. But I'll just I just need to get in the zone. If I can get in the zone, I'm good. Sometimes I get into the zone sooner than other shows, but we'll see how our visit goes today. Looks like everything's fine. I've said hi to a number of you. I think that I'm going to take my walk early. So I, I wasn't going to tell you this, but I guess I will. Richard Waite is our guest from the United States Geological Survey, and this is a big deal. He is one of the biggest names in the entire game. And we've tried three times, three different days, most recently yesterday, with AV technology, and it has not worked any of the three days. We're 0 for 3, <laughs> just connecting by Zoom. And so I think I want to send my email link to Richard a few minutes early just to buy him a few extra minutes, and he might need to get some tech help yet again to connect. But I will, I will uh, sigh a, I will let out a huge sigh of relief if and when we successfully get Richard cooking with his Zoom window. And I privately am hoping that we don't have to do anything except just talk. I just want to talk to Richard for an hour. And he's willing to answer some of your questions, but I, I hope we don't have to share screens and everything else because um, just getting connected is going to be a struggle. So with that said, um, say a little prayer for us here, and uh, I'm going to put you out the window a little bit early. I'm going to take my walk. I think I'm going to take an extra long walk just to give Richard some extra time to get connected by Zoom, and then we will be up and running. I think it's just going to be, if we can get to the point where Richard and I are on the same Zoom call, and the video and audio is working, I think Richard's not going to be able to see any of the stuff I'm doing. So I will try to just kind of go to him very quickly, I think. I might just show a couple of, of slides or something. But um, it's especially important to get us rolling with Zoom as soon as possible. So I feel better just sharing that with you. I don't know why I did. But um, I know why I did. I feel better just sharing it with somebody. Okay, so the, uh, com, uh, uh, let's let's uh, initiate the uh, loud 19-year-olds in the hallway, and why we do that, you know, we're all just uh, extras in their movie, right there. Full volume, the entire walk down the hallway. I'm used to it. I was probably the same way as a 19-year-old. Actually, no, I wasn't. Okay, thanks for joining us, everybody. I love you. Vinman's Bakery loves you. And we'll see you at the top of the hour, which is in six minutes from now. And, of course, you already know if you're watching this in replay, you could have skipped ahead long ago. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Ned Zenger's talking to himself. He's starting a new Zoom window. He's getting that window onto the second monitor. It's third person Thursday. Ned Zinger is getting this zoom window smaller so that it fits nicely on the second monitor. And he's going to invite somebody to join him. It would be pathetic if he was just doing a zoom meeting to himself. That would be sad. And so we type in Richard Waite's email address. And away that goes. Okay. Fingers crossed. Hot mic. Hot mic.
Well, Richard, all that all that praying pay it off. I can hear you, and better than that, I can actually frickin' see you, man. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> well, I, I'm... I, I'm so pleased, and, and and this is great. How you feeling with uh, your camera? Did you? I can see kind of your kind of chin is cut off a little bit. Do you want to? You can. That that's good. That's good right there. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, well, I'm live streaming right now, and they can hear me, but they cannot hear you. And just to remind you, I'm going to get started in just a second. I'm just going to swing you off to the side of my monitor so that you can still hear me, but you you won't be able to see what's going on. I'm going to be five minutes or less, and then we'll just bring you in, and then they will be able to hear you, and we can just kind of go for it. So you will hear it but you won't see i'm just going to show a couple of slides but i'll just i'll just kind of describe them and you'll you'll know it. i'm just showing burling game basically okay feeling comfortable okay all right well thank you very much richard we'll see you in just a couple minutes you sit tight now Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Ice Age Floods A to Z live stream series. I'm your host, Ned Zinger, and today we have a very special guest. It feels like I say that every time, but I mean it this time. This guy is one of the biggest names in the game, and we are extremely lucky to have him join us. He's a busy guy, uh, and, and so Richard Waite from the United States Geological Survey will be with us live in just a few minutes. He's in Zoom right now listening to us, and I promise to bring him in as soon as, as, as humanly possible. But I do think I have a couple of quick roles to play with you. Most of you have been watching the entire series, and you know that we have a color scheme now, correct? I'm wearing a red shirt today because we are mostly talking about marine isotope stage 2 today the last glacial, the late Wisconsin, whatever you want to call it, and Richard Waite's work, much of it over the last 50 plus years, has been devoted to documenting many Missoula floods during the red time, during the stage two time. And we're going to focus on that specifically. But our guest today also is interested, uh, at least recently, uh, in publishing papers on the very old Ice Age floods. So I don't know if I'm going to literally take off my red shirt for those portions, but we are going to go older than stage two, I think, on occasion. But mostly, I just want this to be a conversation with Richard. I want us to all just to get a chair, get on one of those little camp chair. We can all huddle around the campfire and listen to this guy who's been thinking, publishing, doing field work on the Ice Age floods for half a century. Plus, that's the plan. The other thing I want to do extremely quickly, and I plan to do it extremely quickly, hold me to it please, is I'm going to the slideshow right now and I want to simply show you a bunch of sexy images that go along with today's topic. The sexy images are Burlingame Canyon. And so if we do this, and I can maybe get the right zoom, I'm showing video right now. Richard, I'm showing these guys some beautiful drone video. Uh, from some footage we got from the Washington Wine Commission at Burlingame Canyon. And this is the place that we'll factor in, at least to the earliest part of our discussion with Richard today. Look at this place. Look at these repetitive, chalky gray layers, slackwater sediments, in southern Washington. We're near Walla Walla, Washington. And this is private land, unfortunately. But this private land was accessible by Richard Waite and other geologists 50 years ago, and the secrets and the details that came out of these Burlingame Ravine layers are profound. Let's keep going. A uh, photo courtesy of Kevin Pogue at Whitman College. 40 layers equals 40 floods. And you have many Richard Waite papers waiting for you at nicksutner.com, including the 1980 paper when he first documents this repetitive story in Burlingame Canyon. The general thought, and this is very quick, is that those slackwater sediments were originally Lus of Palouse Hills. We bring in some Ice Age flood water from Montana. We sweep a bunch of that Lus away. And then when we're in Lake Lewis, 
that silt, which was originally in the Lewis Hills, is now redeposited under quiet water. And the interpretation by Richard and many others that each of these chalky white layers is a separate Missoula flood. We only have a few ways to keep track of time in that stack of dozens of slack water sediments. Here's the Mount St. Helens Set S uh, Tephra. And notice the date, 16,300 calendar years ago. So this is the same St. Helens that you know. But it's not the same St. Helens that you know as far as 1980 is concerned. Another batch of beautiful drone photography, video, flying through the walls of Burlingame Canyon. This is the wheelhouse for Richard Waite and one of his major contributions uh, post J. Harlan Bretz. Yep, Jim O'Connor sent that. If we go over to Nine Mile that Larry Smith was talking about a few weeks ago, now we're now on I-90 in western Montana, there are similar fine chalky beds and so there have been some correlations by Richard and others to say those beds at Nine Mile uh, can be correlated, uh, more or less, with those beds in southern Washington. Finally, some photos sent by Jim O'Connor the other day. Here's Richard Waite uh, with his fashionable hat and his uh, trowel, and he's looking at the St. Helens set esh. Here's another O'Connor photo of Waite leading a field trip with his little portable microphone, and I believe that Black baseball cap says bullshit on it. It's a nice touch. <laughs> yes, we're going to Richard Waite today. And why prolong this anymore? Let's get to this guy. Richard Waite, USGS. i got to get my headphones on. Hang on. And here you are. How are you today, Richard, down there in the greater Portland area? Well, greetings. Uh, yeah, it's kind of cool here today. I put a sweater on, and uh, here I am. Yeah. Here you are. Thank you for your time. Um, I want to go wherever you want to go, but you know uh, that I, I think just a conversation back and forth is the way to go. Can we start with your student days at the University of Washington? Were you a Pleistocene person before you showed up to study with Steve Porter? Yeah, we uh, we all have some sort of a lineage, um, and uh, mine. I'm from New England, and I ended up at the University of Texas, and uh, and a wonderful school, soft rock schools, which taught a lot of stratigraphy and sedimentology. Sedimentology is taught by Bob Folk himself, um, wow. and a lot of stratigraphy, and uh, so I had all of that, uh, and I I did a master's thesis. I stayed there for master's thesis, and. Uh, did it in, on ignimbrites in, uh, in Western Mexico. My supervisor became Jay Hoover Mackin. <clears throat> oh, Mackin, wow. Mackin um, had been a student of Douglas Johnson at Columbia, and Johnson had been a student of, uh, um, oh God, uh, at my age, you do forget names somewhat. Yeah, I but, got you, I got you, I feel uh, you. Yeah, anyway, uh, anyway, that uh, Mackin, um, when I went in, so I took geomorphology and he had this wonderful uh, course that everybody talks about whoever had it. It was called Map and Photo Interpretation, which about 95% of it was actually topographic maps. And he'd sling out a map, d deal it out to the class, and your job was to tell the geology of that quadrangle just from the topography. And don't go putting your nose in books too much for it either. Work it out yourself. Huh. So that was a kind of, that, so anyway, he was a wonderful teacher that way. Uh, a, a different kind of Socratic method. But anyway, when I went in one day and, and announced, you know, I think I'd like to uh, go on in glacial geology. He said, well, you're either going to Ohio State or University of Washington. <laughs> like there's no other place on earth uh, <laughs> to study glacial geology. Uh, mm -hmm. or, yeah, so I did end up at UW. Um, and when I got there, although a lot of students were trying to go off to uh, you know, the Himalaya and uh, Andes and stuff like that, other exotic places. I came to work in the Cascades, so I wanted to, to uh, work there. So I, you know, Steve Porter had become my professor. And when I, when he, when it, we started talking about thesis, I just said, I want to work in the Cascades. What do you have? And that kind of thing. I didn't really have any ideas of myself at that point. So why don't I shut up with that? With that. No, that's good. We're, we're just going to keep going. I love this old stuff, obviously. And, that, and that, that wasn't an insult, by the way. But what, what date are we talking about when you arrive in Seattle? In the 60s sometime? Yeah, 1960. Uh, 
late yeah i i work with a canadian geological survey for three summers my third okay. summer was that one northern newfoundland i was okay. i came back we drove up from texas to uh seattle got there in september i think of uh uh, early September of uh, 1969, okay. not too long after a bomb had gone off in the administration building. It was during those Vietnam protest yeah. days. So yeah, there was all that okay. going on around campus too. Sure. Okay, well, we're going to push your memory bank here, but do you remember Mackin talking at all about this, the channeled scab lands or even Porter? Because I remember interviewing you 10 years ago and you were, I think at that time, saying, I don't even remember talking about Brett's much when I was taking Pleistocene classes with Porter. Yeah, that's kind of ironic, isn't it? Um, yeah. Mackin, Mackin didn't have much to say about it, which really surprised me in retrospect. You know, I didn't, when I was down there as a student, you know, I'm I'm still in diapers as a professional at that point. I don't know what's right. going on. And, right. uh, and uh, you know, he one of the maps he talked about was, uh, I'm not sure he dealt this one out for us, but it was, uh, it was uh, it included uh, uh, part of Rathdrum Valley and uh, Coeur d'Alene Lake. And he just, oh. but they mainly talked about, this is a big mainstream side stream issue. And here the mainstream's one, you know, so the, all this junk coming down the uh, Rathdrum Valley had dammed up uh, Coeur d'Alene Lake was the principal, but I didn't know anything about the Missoula floods. He never talked about it. I mean, it was, mm. I, in retrospect, I just wonder what exactly what he did thought. And I, I actually say, I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure he, agreed with Brett's, but it was never enough to to say it publicly very much. Right. I think is what I feel. Yeah. Uh, well, how about Porter? So you get to the UW and Porter was a Flint student. And so was there talk of Flint all over the place uh, and, and hush hush about Brett's or even Porter was just kind of teaching his own Cascade Ice stuff and not really addressing the Flint uh, Brett's uh, d uh, relationship at all. Yeah, I, and I don't remember too much about that. There wasn't wow. any kind of there wasn't any kind of politics uh, in the classes and that kind of thing. So yeah. th those kind of old older arguments, I think, were just simply not mentioned. I mean, yeah. I, I can't even remember whether we talked about Missoula floods or not. Not much. I mean, because it was more mainstream glacial geology and moraines and ice ages, you know, and that kind of. That's what that's what Porter was all about. And uh, the. Uh, he he. Uh, th there was one student, Larry Hansen, but it wasn't. He wasn't a Porter student. He's a um, Bates McKee student, I think. I can't remember yeah. who his supervisor was, but um, working in uh, Moses Cooley, and so that was Larry's finished up on uh, just shortly after I got there, I guess, or a year or two later. Anyway, he was ahead of me, so that was on the plate in the department. But it wasn't. It, we we didn't make much of it in the classes I took with Porter and others in quaternary geology. Huh. Did you hang around and get to know Larry Hansen? I thought he taught there a little bit. Was Did you he overlap did. physically with him? He, yeah. He, oh, yeah. Um, Larry Larry got his PhD, and then he um, he got hired on to, uh, like many departments, the uh, 101 geology courses tend to languish. The uh, UW have been teaching them team taught, and it wasn't making much sense because one prof comes in and doesn't necessarily know what the previous one had done and all of that. So they they weren't. And so Larry took the whole thing over and uh, organized it and organized the labs. He did a lot of the teaching himself, and it really invigorated the programs. And hundreds and hundreds of students came into geology through all that, and including Larry. I mean, a lot of it, Larry's work. Um, so, yes, and he stayed there for quite a number of years, uh, uh, invigorating the 101, Geology 101 program and coordinating all of the labs and all of that kind of stuff. So people like me who had a TA, a teaching assistantship, right. teaching a lab, you're sort of under, I mean, not under Larry's thumb because he wasn't that way, but he, but, right. but you know, he was coordinating us, trying to, trying to keep, trying to keep the teaching part of it consistent for students. Well, you're doing great, by the way. I'm just loving this. Your mic's working perfectly. So thanks going to whatever you best buy or something the what was your story about finding that headset after the super bowl yeah, yeah I, went, I went down there to buy a headset and uh you know you go all over the store these are for games and this is for something else and then oh you want it for office work well, you have to go over there to the so i got over there and the rack is largely empty uh, and uh and then i so i picked up this is the only one that was there and and I thought some other one. The guy said, "Well, what do you expect? It's after Super Bowl. You know, we have all these sales, and so they were sold out when I walked in there." Well, that's that's the best twenty nine ninety nine I think you've ever spent because it's working. It's working beautifully, Richard. Um, 
I don't mean to force this issue, and you can tell me to get off of it, but I didn't even think of you overlapping with Larry Hansen. So if Porter wasn't talking about the floods, do you remember any conversations with Larry? Here he's doing this incredible PhD on Moses Cooley. Was there yeah, any talk well, with, there? Yeah, well, I mean, we're sort of working into something a little bit here. I, I, You know, again, I was not into that topic. When I finally did start working on a PhD thesis, um, I had Porter... Porter said, well, if you want to work in the Cascades, there's the, the Mentel Valley that, that uh, Barky, uh, Julian Barksdale did uh, in, the, in the 40s, and maybe it's time for a, 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 a modern uh, quaternary geologist to have another look at it. And then the other thing was the Okanagan Valley in the United States. And I went up and looked at both of them, was fascinated with both, but I wanted to work in the mountains, so I ended up in the Mentel, which was a glacial geology thing, you know, ice sheet plus a fantastic um, alpine uh, uh, topography there. So I was, I was embedded with that and mostly up in the mountains and not thinking much about the Columbia. So again, even up there, I wasn't, I still wasn't into the floods yet. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure where we're going. I think it's time for you to ask a question. Let me yeah, shut up. That's please. good. That's good. Um, listen, you don't have to shut yourself up. If you go for mm -hmm. 20 minutes straight, I'm, uh, we're all ears. This, so however you want to go is great. Um, well, I, did, I didn't know where this topic was going, so I thought it was time for you to re refocus it. <laughs> well, sometimes I don't know either, but we'll, we'll, just, we'll just feel our way along. How about this? Let's jump ahead to you meeting Brett's. Like at what point did you did you physically meet J. Harlan Bretz? And then we can backtrack if you want to some of your work coming out of the Metal. But we we, we feel right. like we we know this guy so well by now. Did you have an interaction with with J. Harlan Bretz? All right, that's I came in through a very back door. Um, so in the Metal, um, I eventually got down to the mouth of the valley. I was trying to, most of the work was done up valley in the mountains and the moraines and in the lower part of the valley was more difficult to work with. And when I, there was something down in the very lower part of the valley that I just, at the time didn't make any sense. And eventually, I think the only way I can explain this big gigantic basalt boulder sitting on what appeared to be till and all the till was from up valley, you know, it would be if the thing was let down on the end of a string. In other words, a flood so that was my thinking anyway. So finally, I start messing around with the Columbia, and the Columbia's got all this fantastic stuff in it. And I, from then, from then on, it became increasingly hard to put the blinders on and stay back up in the mental because the Columbia got interesting. But I, even at that point, I hadn't read Brett's. Uh, I, well, I knew, I knew, I knew a general part of it, you know, and it had to do with a Cheney Palouse and stuff like that. And and when I did start reading, Brett's thought that Columbia was not flooded anyway, so it still didn't have any relevance necessarily. But mm -hmm. I started finding big evidence for flood up there at the mouth of the Metal. Uh, so so something was not right. So I started reading Brett's uh, gradually, and Brett's is a fantastic writer, uh, very very observant. Uh, the best way to read his stuff is to take it out in the field and look at what he's describing in the mm. field. And you see, mm. you can see he's got it very good. Uh, Brett's was also a geomorphologist primarily. He, you know, the shape of the land, what is this telling me? And uh, you stand in front of any one of these places where he talks about a round top bar and foss on this side. And it's, it's, it's true. It's, it's true to what you see in the field today when you go to these same places. So I started doing that a little bit. Uh, later, after the thesis, I, I taught for th for three years at Franklin and Marshall and then uh, oh, college. Really? Oh. And then I joined the USGS and, in Menlo Park. And the job was uh, was a big map in the North Cascades of Wenatchee one by two degree sheet, which includes the four corners of that are Chelan. Well, the two east corners are Chelan and Vantage, roughly. So it included the Columbia. So I got mapping in the Columbia again, finally, in its tributaries. And there... Um, I started reading a little bit more about Brett's because uh, down from Wenatchee down anyway, there was clear evidence of some sort of flood uh, thing, although not, well, I should say it was really below, it was, it was lower, it was down around Vantage, clearly, uh, flood, flood, flood stuff. But um, um, up on Babcock Bench, which is west of Quincy Basin, I was up on there and Brett's in 1956, that Brett's at all. Uh, had advocated two periods of flood up there. They distinguished. And then I walked around and said, you know, I don't know about that. They, uh, the soil's about the same age. Uh, I couldn't really see. That. Yeah, there's a difference in sediment here and not there. But I just thought they didn't really have very good evidence for that. And somewhere along the line, I've, 
I discovered Vic Baker. I mean, he was, meanwhile, he's working, doing a lot of fantastic work in the East and central part of uh, 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 Grand Coulee. And I didn't really know much about that. I started reading uh, Baker and Baker also was taking this. So, so Brett's, you know, spent most of his career trying to get across the idea of one giant flood initially or early he called it Spokane flood. And then later when um, Glacial Lake Missoula became the obvious source of water, he started calling them Missoula floods. Mm -hmm. um, that might've been in the 1956 paper when that happened. But um, uh in the 1956 paper, and then and then again in the 1969 paper, Brett's in, in 1956 he introduced the idea of several floods, and maybe as maybe six or possibly seven uh, floods, and he's, it's, it's geomorphic evidence in northern Quincy Basin. Uh, so this is where one flood bar is sitting there, and then it's chopped off on one side, and another bar crosses it at right angles, and so right. obviously a one-two sequence. And, and that kind of geology, Brett's was very good at. He, and he got that right, of course. Um, and but then Baker comes along, and his his 1973 uh, uh, GSA special paper was at 144. I forget the number, but uh, he uh, he says, well, you know, you can do you can make the same geomorphic sequence more simply, uh, with, in, and taking Occam's razor and making you know giving the simplest explanation for it. Let's just do it with one big monster flood, and it's waning flow. Because as the flood subsides, it's going to cut off a channel here. Farther down, it'll cut off one there. And so you're going to end up with these cross-cutting relations. Uh, you know, Grand Coulee might be the last one flowing. And so, so it'll make the same sequence with one flood and its waning flow. So he was chopping down on these floods. Uh, we, we didn't know each other at that point. And so okay. we, we um, eventually we got to lead a part of a field trip together in 1977, it was a GSA meeting in Seattle, uh, Don Easterbrook kind of left us holding at the bag at the end and we, we somehow pulled it off. But, uh, <laughs> we, we, uh, uh, you know, at the end of that conference, we were sort of at the happy agreement that, uh, we could do all of this, everything, either one of us knew you with one or two floods. I needed, I think Brett's, I mean, Baker wanted, he could do it with one. But I needed two because I knew enough about Moses Cooley that I needed at least uh, one flood for Moses Cooley. Um, and when I say at least, there's something I was denying at that point uh, that I knew about. Uh, but I still, I still couldn't do Moses Cooley without some some separate issue, you know, with all the moraines up there around it and stuff like that. You just no matter how you sliced it, you had to have something separate for Moses. So I was happy with okay, we can do it all with two, and Baker with uh, Baker could do it with one, I think, is the way he thought. Um, anyway, we're, we're sort of in, in agreement about that um, at the end of the field trip. And uh, I guess that was in October of 1977. So okay. I will stop there. <laughs> okay. Well, have you got have you got lubrication there? I mean, we're going to go a while, as long as you feel like you want to go. You got something to drink just to keep yourself wetted up? Um, yeah. Um, since Here's we're talking about... Yeah, Moses. I'm gonna I'm gonna see oh if boy. I can bring because this I'm gonna see if I can bring up. I got a PowerPoint up, and I'm okay. gonna see if we'll, we'll just see if I can. If this doesn't work quickly, though, I'm not gonna do it. Um, okay. But I hope I want to bring up a slide if I can, which I have inside of a PowerPoint. Now let's see what do I do here. I I do this, and then I think if I do. I'm not sure what's going to happen here. Uh, uh oh, I, I. Oops. We still have you, but can you see us, you and I, still? Uh, no. Let me let me do something here. I'm going to minimize. Okay. Oh crap! How do I? <laughs> uh, viewers, let me talk to you directly. Um, you All will right. get a All chance right. to ask uh, ask Richard Waite okay. some questions. Oh, you got you. I I think. I think what I can do now is learn how to share screen here somehow. Okay. How do I okay. do that? Well, the, down below the two of us in the Zoom window, there's a green oh, yeah. button. Right. I, I, I'm just going to try to show one slide that meant a lot to the story, and I it's what I denied for a year, three, three or four years. All right. Okay. So what, do, I, do I hit the share screen button? I think you do. All take right. Your, take your time. You're All my right. friends. And then, and then what? Well, uh, you should have options to 
uh, share yeah. a selection or share your window or share. Okay, okay. There you go. We can, yes, right. we can see what you have. Well, <laughs> what I perfect. What I, what I want to do now is let's let's add that this one advance. There it goes. Yep, you got it. There. Can you see that? We can see it. Nice job. All right. So that's a slide, right? It is. Showing some, showing some stratigraphy. This is what I call Rock Island Bar. It's just above Rock Island Dam okay. um, and on, the, on the east side of Columbia River. Mm -hmm. um, so this section I got to and measured in 1976. Okay. Uh, it was at that point uh, on this Wenatchee project, mapping the Wenatchee Valley from up, up trying to go from up or down. It, it, I, I couldn't. I didn't have control of my project because I had to satisfy other people. So huh. um, anyway, if I eventually got, I, I mean, the trouble with the Wenatchee is you've got all this stuff coming down the valley from the, the glaciers and streams and stuff like that. Maybe more, more than one glaciation, nice glaciers at Leavenworth and the kind of lure that's about what, about 30 miles or so above the mouth of the valley. At mm -hmm. the mouth of the valley though, it's, it's, it's the valley mouse at the Columbia. And down there, you've got this big, flood stuff by that time i'd figured out uh i mean the wenatchee was not known to be flooded necessarily but that uh, one look at air photos in 1976 and i saw these giant pangborn bar and all of that and i'd been on a field trip earlier uh so that had been primed for that too a guy named bill long mm, had, yeah. Uh, yeah. figured out that uh there was some big stuff coming down the valley and flowing up the wenatchee so i'm trying to went when map the wenatchee valley mm -hmm. Um, eventually I had to come to grips with the Columbia because there's so much st stuff in the lower Wenatchee Valley. It isn't all coming down the valley from the glaciers. Something's coming into it from the Columbia. Uh -huh. So eventually I got into the Columbia. And this, this, uh, this picture I have here, um, uh, we, we, we finally got a boat and all of that so I could get over to places like this. And uh, uh, what you see here. Yes. So, so the, all right. So the Columbia Valley is coming down across northern Washington. Uh, lots of uh, granitic rocks, uh, gneissic rocks, uh, uh, argillites, belt rocks, all kinds of uh, the metal uh, valley rocks, all these kinds of bright rocks, sandstones and um, all kinds of crystalline rocks of various sorts. You know, everything mm -hmm. granite to gabbro. Uh, anyway, it's a bright. It makes a very bright gravel. And then here you got. Uh, you, 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 you see these beds here, uh, so so it's all slumped in. But when you you see, can you see my pointer? Definitely, yes. All right, so it's red now. Yes, yes. All right, I changed that so it show up better. Um, so, so like right there, is a is a it's a gravelly sand. It's probably like a pebble gravel or a oh. sandy pebble gravel um, there, and. There's, there's hardly any, it, there almost no or, or, or zero crystalline rocks in it. It's all basaltic. Mm -hmm. And so, the, and likewise, you go up to this bed right there and up to there and yep. up to there. You can see it's black. It's all basalt. Yeah. For, furthermore, you can see a sense of uh, foreset bedding that's dipping up the valley. So this clearly had come out of Moses Cooley. This could not be water coming down the Columbia or okay. it have bright rocks in it. Yeah. Uh, although you can see what it would be because when you go up here, there is a flood deposit up there or giant current dunes on it. And that's all a big bright gravel up there. So mm -hmm. up there is what you expect to see with uh, in the Columbia from the river coming down uh, or, or across the north and then down down past, you know, uh, Okanagan, Metau, uh, Entiat Valley, Wenatchee Valley. It's got all this bright stuff in it. Yes. But this... All this, you know, two thirds of the section, the lower half of it anyway, is all this black stuff. They only come out of Moses Cooley. Hmm. Well, that, so what's the stratigraphy all about? Here's a here's a black bed down here. You can see it exposed there. And then there's a fine lake sediment of some sort. I mean, at the when I first saw this, I didn't realize it, but it's got varves in it. I mean, hmm. I didn't see the varves at first, but it definitely has varves in it. Mm -hmm. And you go up and here's more coarse sand. Here's the course as that one, a pebble, pebble gravel again. You go up and there's this fine stuff like a lake sediment, also with varves there. And I, I might not have counted right here. That's the second one. You know, there's a third one, the fine bed, a fourth one, and then lots of fine stuff. You can see, even see uh, rhythmic bedding in that right there. Can you see that? Yep. Mm -hmm. 
So what this seemed to tell me is there was a flood coming out of Moses Cooley and then a pause and a stoppage even. I didn't, as I said, I didn't see the VARBs at first to, to yeah. prove a stoppage, but it looked like a stoppage. Yeah. And then another, another flood from Moses Cooley, you know, this is back flooding miles up the Columbia at this point, you know, like huh. five miles. Right. Coarse stuff shed up the Columbia, you know, in the wrong direction. Uh, it's also shedding down, of course, but this part of it that was going up. So what the hell's that doing? And another stoppage, another flood bed, another stoppage, another flood bed, and a big stoppage, a long stoppage. I mean, it, and, you know, as I said, uh, just starting to come to grips with Brett saying, what the hell's going on here? Is this evidence of four floods? How the hell could this be? Excuse mm. my language, I guess. Go How the heck could this be? Go for um, it. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, come on, least, man. I'll, I'll try to use the H word anyway instead of <laughs> Southern. So, <laughs> what's going on here? Uh, this, this is if this is Moses Cooley. Moses Cooley was cut off, cut off from the flood history, whatever the heck it was during most of its history. The mm. Okanagan loads up there blocked it. Uh, how, how could this be happening? Uh, so I was essentially in denial about this section for a very long time. So then after, um, so now we're going to go back to that meeting at the end of it. Uh, Baker and I, I see, I was in denial, denial about this exposure when I came to the happy agreement with uh, Vic uh, that we, we could do it with one or two floods. Right. I, I just didn't even want to talk about this at the time because I mm -hmm. didn't know what to make of it. It just make any sense to me. And uh, all right. So now the field trip ends. Don Swanson, who was mapping basalt, in this uh, Wenatchee project that I mentioned, he drags me down to the Walla Walla Valley because he's mapping the whole plateau, mm. whole, whole, Columbia, whole Great Columbia Plain, as I like to call it, uh, all the basalt in it. And he's working all over the place. And so he's in Walla Walla Valley, up in the uplands around it, there are these faults, linear faults, uh, cutting the basalt. And some of them seem to align with lineaments down in the Quaternity stuff, The you know, the find stuff this junk in the in the valley he said why don't you come down and let's see if we can see if there's any faulting that cuts the quaternary stuff so that's he drags me down to the walla walla valley huh. and we're doing around that uh, it doesn't matter how that turned out but in the course of that we're on the south side of the valley driving along to, what in the <clears throat> i say heck is <laughs> that and it's this giant canyon out in uh -huh. the middle of the valley uh, at a distance so we find our way over to it uh, at the time, no, nobody to stop us from going in, and we did. And, you know, it's this fantastic cut. Now, what is it doing here, first of all? And then what it's showing us, well, you showed the photos that I didn't see, but uh, all these layered beds in there. And right at, you know, right off the bat, I saw that ash layer. Um, do, do, you it, have a, it, do you have a photo, Richard? Do you want to advance your slides? Did you have a Berlin game uh, show that you want to show us? Let's just see. I'm not sh sure how this this. I don't uh, bring. I, I I have another PowerPoint, but I don't. That's I fine. Don't, That's fine. Uh, it, I think yeah. it might take too long to get it up. You've, sure. Well, let's let's. Can we actually actually? Go, what's up now? Is is this? Yeah. I I should go back at least to the relevant slide. Okay. Well, all right. Let's go to this one. Good. So this is one looking down at one actually. This is a shot I took out of an airliner on my way back to. I was job hunting in, in Pennsylvania, and so the the skies open, and this is Wenatchee. It's a city of Wenatchee, Wenatchee platted out there. The Columbia, the Cascades over here, Columbia Plateau or Plain here, big landslide complex, and then this thing, this huge bar, wrapped around it. You know, in the in the position of a point bar in a normal river, but it's you know it's three or four orders of magnitude larger than a point bar along a river. Right. And look at these giant current ripples all over it. Look, look at the there's the Pangborn airfield. Look at those giant current ripples. Huh. This is in February, this time of year. It just was covered. With, it was just a beautiful. I mean, I didn't even notice the ripples when I'm taking the shot. But later, I said, you know, holy crap. You know, look yeah. at that. So this is when I realized this was a big flood bar. That was my revelation that all this had been called glacial in in the past, including including the geological map of Washington at the time, called this glacial deposit. And uh, well, that's cause, not glacial. Because <laughs> Brett, cause, cause Brett's was calling it glacial, I think. Uh, even in the yeah. 50s, he's talking moraine. Uh, it, what was well, he yeah, looking so, so, Well, think of Brett's. He's, he doesn't have air photos yet. He never went yeah. flying. He hated airplanes. His, his son, Rudy, was a pilot. But he, but he, Rudy said his dad told him, you'd never get me up in one of those contraptions. Oh, and, boy. you know, 
<laughs> when Brett's is in the, in the 19-teens, maybe they were contraptions, but they weren't later. But anyway, he's he's down there doing his field geology, beautiful field geology. He probably got up here. If he did, though, he's going to walk over these things, and they, they just look at, like moraines. He thought this was a moraineal complex. Um, you, you just got these big ridges, and there's a few boulders and stuff like that. But he yeah. he, he doesn't know what to mean. The, the concept of giant current ripples doesn't come down the pike until – uh, 1952, yeah, when he's doing, uh, and George Neff uh, shows him some of your photos, and then Brett says, "Holy smokes, that's what I've been mm -hmm. walking over all these years." Mm -hmm. and, but he, so if if he walked over these, and I wouldn't doubt that he might have, he he would have caught. He he just thought it was some sort of moraine topography. I see, I see. Yeah. Well, you're doing a beautiful job. I don't know if you want to stick with any more slides or if we should stop your share so we can go back to the two of yeah, us let's, talking. Let's, let, let's stop the share. Uh, okay. wait, I don't want to leave. I want to stop sharing. Yeah. There you okay. go. Perfect. All right. Okay. All right. Well, let me take just a moment and talk to the viewers directly. Viewers, it's uh, 1235 locally here, and I'm thinking another 15 minutes, just me and Richard. I'm going to hog another 15 with him. Uh, roughly, and then uh, Richard needs to go down the hall and get some more water, it sounds like. Are you okay? I'm okay, yeah. Okay. I'm, 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 I'm coffeeed up, so I know okay. I'm good. good for another few hours if I have All right. to <laughs> uh, So, viewers, you're going to get your chance to ask some questions directly of Richard Waite in, in, I'd say, 15 minutes or so, but I want to keep going. So, um, yeah. I know we want to go to Burlingame, but yes. I can't I can't hold it. Is is Are you... As you're mapping in that Wenatchee quad, are you running your ideas of how you're mapping these deposits by any floods person? Are you writing Brits? Are you writing Baker? Or any? Are you working in a yeah. vacuum with those flood deposits? All right, so now we go back to Burlingame. Um, so with that trip with Don Swanson, uh, yeah. that was the last, the last field stop of the season. That was the 1977 season. Okay. So I had those photos and that image and uh, just one trip up and down the canyon trying to, you know, and I was trying to explain to Don how this has been explained, but, you know, Brett's never saw that exposure, but he did see similar things in the Walla Walla Valley. And then, uh, and he just said, uh, you know, it's got to be some sort of pulsation taking place within a flood. And then Vic Baker picked up that ball and ran with it. And so the, the, the story on the street at that time was that this is some sort of uh, seishing or pulsing taking place within a Missoula flood. And so, so my question, I, you know, I'm, I stared, went, went down on that canyon, went down, saw that ash layer, and then came back up. And I just kneeled at it and dug it out a bit. I just stared at it for probably 15 minutes trying to figure, how could this ash be here and have these two beds above and below uh, one flood, it makes no sense because the water surface is another, like, uh, uh, I forget what it is, 600 feet above our head, uh, uh, 200 meters above our head. Um, and if all of the stuff, this 100 feet, this uh, 30 meters of uh, sediment was deposited in one flood, it's going to be turbid, junky. How can you have an ash layer fall on the surface of that thing, fall through 600 feet of water? I can't remember what it is, something like that. So hundreds of feet of water, go down in this murk, and then end up as a pure glass bed. Right. It's right. And, and then you got to then you got to do it all over again because there's two layers there. So it made it just I I just didn't see how that made any sense at all. And I thought about it all winter long. And next spring, uh, uh, May of 1978, I'm back out in the field. The first thing I do is I go to Burlingame and I measure a section. I spend a couple of days doing it. So at that point, um, even before I had the section. Uh, a quarter measured i knew that each one of those beds was a separate flood other ever other evidence showed up too when you start measuring you notice more detail so at the tops of some of the beds well up on top of burlingame uh, in, in that there's a layer about a meter thick or so of uh loss everybody agrees it's loss it was deposited uh, after these beds were deposited and on top of some of these individual layers farther down there's something that looks identical to it it's massive it's a little bit different color a little a little browner uh, not as gray. Uh, it just looks like loss. So I had that. So I got these loss layers, you know, probably half a dozen beds or more that I found that first first section that I measured. And then I, I noticed the rodent burrows. The so rodent burrows are all through the section. They're not just up high. Rodents can only bur burrow a few meters at the most. And if they were burrowing it, and then they, they are, and you can see it, they, you know, it's loose sediment. 
uh, but these rodent burrows are, are cons consolidated. I mean, they're as consolidated as the surrounding sediment. And they go all the way down, you know, 10 meters down, 15, 20, 30 meters down to the bottom of the canyon, 100 feet down, there's rodent burrows. And they're, they're as consolidated as surrounding sediment. So they have to be Pleistocene burrows. So the rodents, and how, how could that happen? So that, that was consistent with there being a flood and maybe some decades in between, the rodents come out and repopulate, make the burrows, and then they get drowned out again by the next flood. So that's how you get rodent burrows throughout the entire section. Did you, have so anyway, any, did you have any sense of where you were in time at that point? That ash was there, but did you have any sense of how old yes. it was? Yes. Uh, Molino, Don Molino had noticed that ash. Uh, so, you know, Molino, uh, Molino just used it to, to date what he called the last major Missoula flood. Um, and there was no sense of more than one of these things. And uh, it was somehow in the sediments and... Uh, he had some dates that, you know, I think it was 11,000, you know, this is before radiocarbon time is calibrated. Right. And he had some, right. uh, they, they believe they're younger dates. We had 11,000. Um, they had to ignore some older dates. They had to say that. But anyway, uh, yeah, I knew it was late, late, late what, what in the mid when Wisconsin yeah. is called late Wisconsin, uh, yeah. last glaciation. Um, and, and yeah, so. Anyway, so there's, after I measured that section, um, I have 40, suddenly 40 floods. And then, it's only then I can say, okay, now I think I understand that deposit of mouth of Moses Cooley. There can be four there. You know, even if Moses Cooley's cut off during most of its history, there can be a number of floods before that happens. That section suddenly makes sense. And I was in denial about it until I came to grips with Burlingame. Did you write a letter to Brett's at any point right oh, in this part of the story? Yeah. So in other words, when I once I had this story, uh, that part of the story, uh, what, meanwhile, there's a whole field season in the Cascades. And right. when you get back in the fall, I, I start writing this up. And uh, I mean, another thing that has to happen when you got if you've got 40 floods. All right. Now, what else do you need? You need. How how can you make that many floods? And they all look alike. I mean, the, the, the beds, as you saw in the videos, they're all roughly the same. In any one part of the section, they're all about the same size. It's got to be a repeating process of some sort. Uh, so how are you going to do that? Uh, we, I mean, other things that were known included that the glacier of Missoula was there. It had been dammed up by what I end up calling the Purcell Trench Lobe. But that lobe of ice, anyway, that came down the Purcell Trench uh, to like uh, like where Lake Pondere is now and jammed up against the Bitteru Mountains and formed the uh, seal that allowed Glacier Lake Missoula to dam up to the east of it. Uh, so that's where the water had to come from. And so, so now you got to, what's the, how, how can the ice dam release 40 floods like that? So you can, all right. I mean, the, the old fashioned way would be, do you have the ice, ice sheet uh, shuffling forward and shuffling back and forward and back, you know, 40 times and doing it equally each time. Well, that, that was asinine. You know, we, we, we have, we sort of have multiple working hypotheses, but the way it really works is you, 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 you pay lip service to that for about five seconds and right. only to dismiss it right away. Cause you know, it's yeah. absurd. So you never yeah. really, so what I was familiar uh, getting familiar with the Icelandic literature, and uh, I had read quite a bit of that. So I was familiar with how Grimsvatn, uh, as the lake behaves, out in the middle of the uh, Vatnajökull ice cap in Iceland. So it fills up uh, with it's a it's a lake. It's, it's got it's it's iced over, but it's still a lake uh, underneath. Uh, it fills up by about 100 meters, and then dumps, and it dumps out through the ice sheet uh, down to Skaderosander in the south, and the lake subsides by 100 meters, I guess it is, and then starts filling again. And then four years later, roughly four to seven years later, out it happens again and again and again and again. So you have this repeated floods and they're all about the same size. So I just imported that idea. There was papers in, published in 1972 and 1974 by Helgi Bjornsson and, uh, and John Nye about the supposed physics of what's going on at the base of the ice because that's it was you know water's denser than ice so it goes to the bottom so you have to worry about physics at the bottom of the ice sheet so i just imported that idea and and, pl and put it onto the uh, uh purcell trench lobe and i could see how glacier like missouri could do the same thing hmm. you know lake lake builds up behind it behind the ice sheet dumps out 
you know, it, th that f those floods are so immense. I could not imagine the whole like not going out. I mean, the the, the, the physics and discussion about uh, Grimswald is well, maybe the thing can seal itself partway through and have a partial flood. Well, that the, the, these floods are so immense. Uh, it, it you know, once that thing gets gets ripping down a tunnel, it's, nothing's going to close it. Uh, it's too much pressure and too much water coming through. What I think happens is it it starts as a tunnel uh, in the Icelandic mode. But then, you know, you can just think it, st it starts, it starts as like a, let's say it's a meter sized tunnel, but then immediately the water starts transferring its heat to the tunnel wall. So it expands, expands, and you have to think of exponential expansion. So it goes, mm -hmm. and it gets half mile wide, the whole roof collapses and out goes the entire lake. That's how I picture it. And, and maybe at the end, you've got the ice is still all there. Almost. It's there, but it's got this mile wide slot cut from one end to the other. And then what happens? In the center, the walls are, of ice are 2,000 feet high. Ice flows under 300 feet of its own weight. So the base of those two facing ice walls, maybe a half mile or a mile apart, start flowing in towards the valley, valley center. And within weeks or months, I don't know how long it takes, it joins again. And that at that point, Glacial Lake Missoula gets right back in business again, it starts filling. And the ice, you know, over decades, it heals the wound totally. And the ice, the lake can go up almost to its or two or almost to its present size. And then when the instability at the base of the ice happens again, this is the water gets so high behind the ice dam that the ice it, 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 hydraulically just has to go out um, underneath the ice dam. Uh, what happens in the, uh, at the ice dam, and that's a very important point, is that you, you look at this hammerhead lobe of ice and it's what, uh, 60 miles long or something like that. But the east half of it is almost irrelevant because what happens when the lake builds up on the east side is it gradually undermines the, the uh, east side of the ice sheet. So you've got water under the ice sheet. The higher the lake gets, the more it does so. So gradually the whole east half of that ice sheet becomes an ice shelf, essentially. I mean, there's no, there's complete continuity from the water halfway into the glacier at that point. And there's a little there's a little area in the middle and oh and then the lower end of the glacier it's already water's already flowing out that way towards yeah. so it's really a little in the middle is a the high point of the ice sheet is a seal i mean well you can think of it as a seal and that's the part that's the real resistant part and once the lake builds high enough they it can force water through the seal at the base of the ice yeah Bar barclay cam at a caltech uh, glaciologist called it it makes it incipiently buoyant i like that it doesn't mm. float it the, the, the popular version of this that floats it. I don't believe that. It doesn't float. But but it can make it incipiently buoyant so that the tunnel itself can start flowing with water. And then once it does, then the heat from the water, you know, you think the water is cold as hell, but it's, 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 a, well, it's a, that's a mixed metaphor, isn't it? But anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it transfers its heat to the tunnel walls, and then you get this yeah. exponential expansion. Um yeah, so, so you have to kind of understand how the ice dam works. And once you get that, using the Grimswater value and the heat and the exponential, and and um, this whole thing is going to last a few thousand years, so you've got time for 40. And then, yeah, yeah, the first paper said 40 floods, but the ink wasn't even dry in it when we had 53, or I had 53 uh, elsewhere in Walla Walla Valley, and then 62, and then Brian Atwater shortly comes up with a lot more than that. So uh, uh, there's nothing magical about any one of these numbers. Well, but before we go further in the story, you are in the zone now, and we just want to ride this wave as long as you're willing. I mean, this is just exactly what I was hoping for, so thank you, number one. Number two, I have a surprise, and I don't know if, you want, if you're up for surprises or not, but I keep mentioning your letter to Brett's because I have your well, letter that you wrote to Brett's in 1978. Yeah, we, yeah we, we, didn't get, we didn't get to Brett's very much, yeah. Do you want me to answer that question? Well, well, do you, yeah. do you want do you have that letter exchange memorized, or would it be helpful um, for me to read it right now? I, well, I, let me just let me just make the context of this. So, good. I'm, I'm writing this paper in 1978, and uh, I knew right off the bat it was going to be controversial, and I knew Brett's. I you know I knew Brett's was still, Brett's was still there in Chicago, so I. I wrote him and say, would you be interested to look at this manuscript about the Missoula floods? And I told him what the essence of it was. And he said, sure, send along. So I did. And uh, and he was pretty he was pretty interested in it. Uh, he didn't, um, I mean, he said, wow, and all of that. But 
it's clear he didn't also understand it. I could tell that from some of the comments he made. Um, would you so like? A, would, would you like to hear the letter? I I guess so. Is this the one I wrote, Brett's? You wrote, and then I have his reply to you as well. Well, you, you can yeah maybe take. I don't remember. Was it long? I don't want to hear the whole thing. <laughs> it, Go ahead. I'll, I'll yeah. read it fast. You, I, th you, I think it would thing. be fun. I mean, all right. And I'd love to thing. give you. If, I'd love to give you a copy of that letter if you don't have that exchange. I, but these, I, yeah, I, I probably do. Uh, in one of those file cabinets behind me. Well, this this gal Natalie at the University of Chicago sent me a bunch of stuff, including yeah. the the weight folder, yeah. and it's at least this one extent. So so just. Take a break for a second, Richard. You'll still be able to hear me, but I'm going to get you off screen. I just want to read this letter. I think it'll be fun, mm -hmm. and then you can react to whatever you hear if All it's right. about, about what your memory says. Thank you. All right. So let's try that with Richard. So I need to talk to myself. Exit full screen. Super Bowl headset working beautifully. Now we can see. Here we go. Okay. So September 23rd, 1978. And are, are the viewers seeing this? Hang on, I need to, I'm going to make sure the viewers can see this. And Richard, Richard, can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay, great, okay. Can you hear me still? Yes, absolutely, yep. Okay. This is written uh, by Richard Waite to J. Harlan Bretz. Dear Dr. Bretz, I appreciate very much the copy of the Baker Newman Dahl Channeled Scabland book which you sent me during the summer, summer of 78. That volume, like all other papers on Scabland flooding published in the last two decades, embodies the principle that most of the late Wisconsin erosional and depositional features in the Scabland and in the back flooded tributaries were caused by one flood or at most by a few floods. Having recently studied several sections of the Tushi beds in the Walla Walla and Yakima Valleys, in Badger Coulee, Pasco Basin, and the Columbia About Vantage, I am convinced that each of the major rhythmites of the Tushi beds represents a separate, discrete Lake Missoula catastrophic flood, a flood that was preceded and followed by many decades of terrestrial environments. By the way, Richard, uh, Brett's had his red pen out, so he's, he's underlining a separate, and he's underlining the word each, so he's into this. Uh, continuing. The most complete section revealing 38 rhythmites, I infer about two score late Wisconsin floods from a glacial Lake Missoula that self-dumped every 100 years or so. The most compelling evidence in the sedimentological properties indicating aeolian reworking at the top of some of the rhythmites, the distribution of uncontaminated state of the Mount St. Helens set S. tephra couplet that is enclosed by the Tushi beds, the distribution of rodent burrows throughout the thickest section of the Tushi beds, and articulated vertebrate remains, mammoth, rodents, birds, enclosed by the Tushi beds. J. Harlan Bratz, my just completed manuscript augments with new evidence and rationales your early work back in the 20s. And later, in about 56 and 69, it reaffirms that the Chushi beds and other slack water sediment in southern Washington are indeed flood-borne, turbid water, suspended load sediment. It demurs on the few floods or one flood hypotheses and on the preposition, on the proposition of multiple hydraulic surgings during the course of any one flood. The paper intended for Journal of Geology is approximately 40 manuscript pages plus five figures. Come on, man. I am asking, would you care to contribute discussion or criticism to part or all of this manuscript? While I realize that you haven't done fieldwork in the region for many, many years, you are nonetheless the most quoted author. Of course, I would value your comments highly, respectfully, Richard B. Waite, Jr., geologist. <laughs> All right, well, here's Brett's, like three weeks later, replying. Dear Dr. Waite, what a shocker. Just when we believers in a possible succession of Missoula fillings and emptyings, a self-dumping lake every century or so while glacial readvancings repair the bursted dam, exclamation point. Yet who can successfully challenge your idea? Only doubters who without field examination see your evidences of time breaks between successive rhythmites as faulty interpretations. I, J. Harlan Brett, suspect that you may encounter the kind of resistance 
that I found decades ago, and if accepted, Tefra dating seems the only possible way of correlating rhythmite records in different quiet scabland pools and lakes. Haven't you opened a Pandora's box? But I am not a doubter of the verity of your rhythmite records. When I sent Flint the manuscript for the Bretts, Smith, and Neff paper in 56 for his comments, all he wrote me was, quote, Scabland history is proving to be rather complicated, unquote. <laughs> How unacceptable to such as he your present view would be. One of your conclusions I had already arrived at, namely Baker's idea of multiple hydraulic surgings produced in major floods during waiting stages. I am pleased that you I am pleased that you consider publishing in the Journal of Geology, the outlet for several of my Scabland papers. Your manuscript would probably cross my desk anyway, although I don't anticipate that I could be a carping critic, nor a comment adder. Thanks, many thanks indeed for your letter and best regards, J. Harlan Bretz. P.S. If your rhythmite concept survives the critics, you, Richard Waite, may be fated to shine as the brightest star in the galaxy of flood theorists. Oh, boy. You're back on. Do you remember the details of that letter? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I remember all. I, I didn't actually remember the detail I, I wrote of that letter I wrote, but I, I, was, I wanted him... I, I I wrote I guess I wrote in such a way I really wanted his input and yeah, yeah. Uh, so to finish finish the story though about this um, I <laughs> there was a friends of the Pleistocene meeting on the Peoria Luss in Illinois in uh, May I think it was of uh, 1979 and okay. so I wrote Brett's again saying uh, hey I'm going to be on this field trip not too far away could I come up and uh, and, and, if, and and spend a a few hours in the afternoon with you um, at Homewood, and he wrote back saying, "Absolutely not! You have to stay overnight." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so I did. Nice. And, um, yeah, and so I got it. So so because uh, I didn't realize he's he's at that point ninety six years old. Um, I you know I didn't real realize his frailness until I showed up and mm -hmm. his his daughter Rhoda is taking care of him in the house so uh, I show up and we have a session and be he only good for a couple of hours or so and he has to take a rest and so in, in the court since I stayed overnight I did have a time for three or four of these sessions with him um, you know probably two two that first day and two the next day or something like that and I slept in his bed upstairs it was wonderful so I'm going to say something about this. Uh, Brett's reaction. He didn't. He didn't really understand the concept of a self-dumping lake, uh, okay. and he, he. So he queried me about this. Says how? He asked, "How do you? How do you do all these floods? Uh, the, the ice dam moves back and forth, or something like that." I don't remember the nature of his question, something like that. So I said, "No," and I just went through the thing I just did about yeah. the uh, I, the ice dam and the uh, and the uh, the example for. See, Brett's had used the word eucalyptus. In, in his 1925 paper, he knew the word, and there was a literature then. But at that point, the Icelanders themselves didn't understand their their own story. They they thought it had to be an, an eruption you know, happening, and that was the eucalyptus tied the idea of eruption in Brett's time. But by my time, it isn't. It's it's a self. They, you know, the Icelanders have gotten around enough to know that there's the, the, it, they have other lakes like Green Green Alone, off on the same side of the same ice sheet that dumps. A periodically without any kind of uh, uh, vent under it. Hmm. So they, the, the, the Yoklubs are known to be just self-dumping lakes one way or another. It may or may not involve an eruption. So anyway, I, I use the word Yoklubs, but it probably still doesn't mean to him what it means to me. So I don't, I just don't think he understood, he didn't understand it. So here's what he did. I, so I explained this whole thing and he, he's, you know, he's got this pipe and he puffs on his pipe and then he, just think. He, I, I just go quiet. I just let him think about it. And he puffs. And he puffs. And he puffs. And this goes on for two or three minutes. He says, oh, so that's how you do it. <laughs> <laughs> so here's, here's a 96-year-old man that knows the back, scab lines like the back of his hand. And yeah. he, he's taking in a new 
concept that he hadn't realized before. I thought it was great. You know, at 96, I, I, I hope I live to be 96. And if so, I can take in a new concept the way he did at that point. As one, it, is, it just shows what a great man he was uh, all the way through his life. And he was encouraging. He wasn't defensive. He wasn't trying to steer you back to like, wait a minute now. Back in 29, you didn't read my Spokane Flood stuff. And like, was he grilling you at any point or was he just? No, no. And, you know um, he's old, but... and, and, and quite and quite quite frankly, I had not read all his stuff, or at least I, you know, I probably tried to, before I went there, I tried to read it all, but you know, it's so much of it. And, and, and a lot of it you have to appreciate in the field. At that point, I didn't really know much about the Chini Palouse or many of the places, you know, I sort of knew the Northern part of the Grand Coulee. I, I hadn't come to grips with 95% of what he wrote about. Uh, I only knew a, a little fragment of it. And the, the Western areas I knew somewhat and the, upper Grand Coulee to some extent, but not most of the area. It really wasn't until the 1990s that I got around enough through the whole system to yeah. kind of appreciate all of his work. Um, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, you know, no, I'm, I, uh, you know, we got talking inevitably about um, old, old timers. And I said, uh, do you ever meet Gilbert? He said, yes. And so, well, tell me about Gilbert. And so he did. And then Frank Leverett, yeah, he told me, yeah. So he, we went through people like that. It was just, I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I'm still no, young. No. I'm, I'm, I'm maybe out of diapers at this point, but not that far as a, as a professional. And, uh, you know, these, these, these people are heal, especially Gilbert has always been one of my heroes mm. and, and a lot of people's heroes. Um, mm. So to, to have a guy that met him, he said, I didn't have much to do with, uh, with Gilbert, but I did meet him at, I think we met him at meetings is what happened, GSA meetings, something like that. So this well, would have been yeah, Gilbert died in, yeah, in, in probably 1917 vintage, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, all these characters, this whole winter, we've been into Israel Russell and Bailey Willis, and I'm sure he must have had stories for all these guys. Like he did yeah. intersect a number of these very important figures for, from, you know, a long, yeah. long time ago, obviously. Yeah, so it was it was a big eye opener and, and yeah. know, just a very rewarding uh, experience for me. Those those that day and a half uh, that was there. Okay, well, it's the top of the hour. I don't know how you're feeling. We can go to the live viewers and just answer a few questions, or if you've had enough, Richard, and you've got a meeting or whatever. However, how are you feeling? No, I'm fine. I I, I blocked out time this afternoon to deal with you. Thank you. Thank I knew you. I was going to get get zentnered as a verb, and, uh, <laughs> and so so I don't you know you know you know just uh, leave an hour for this. Yeah, yeah that's right. All yeah. right. Okay. Well, good. Well, viewers, let's go to you. Thank you. Uh, uppercase uh, viewers, we're going to have you ask questions directly of Dr. Richard Waite. I don't have any other secret letters uh, stashed. Uh, this is not this is your life or anything like that that was that worked out just right though i was hoping to do that with you and viewers we are when we when we're done with richard we're going to do we are going to talk in detail about the 1956 paper and the 1952 field season and thomas from seattle just brought a bunch of uh flint's documents over to me made a special delivery this morning so we're going to look at a little bit of that as well so i'm just uh, there's a little delay in the comments uh, Dean from Spokane, Richard, have the Moses Cooley floods been dated? Um, However you want to answer that. Yeah. Um, let's see. How do I answer that? Well, all right. They're clearly part of the last glacial stories. They're dated in that sense. Um, one of the, since I worked in the western part of the system, uh, Columbia Valley, uh, lower Moses Cooley, uh, the, the mouth of Moses Cooley was on our map. Uh, so, you know, the map project. So anything was in inside the map boundaries, but by extension, I'd map a few miles outside. So I went up Moses Cooley uh, out into Quincy Basin a bit. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I was, I, I, but I didn't really, um, the main, really the main, uh, well, the, the the bar at the mouth of Moses Cooley is really gigantic. It's a huge flood bar, a huge complicated one that went up valley and down. So there's that. But I didn't really uh, work on it stratigraphy wise, except mainly in that exposure that I mentioned up there, right. which told me there were at least four floods out of it. Um, 
but but uh, since I was working in the West, I and, and you know you got the Okanagan lobe, so I could just see from the topography how the system had to have worked. You know the the, the Okanagan lobe. I, you know the the big bar at Pangborn. Um, I think I found that in 1976 or thereabouts. Uh, um, that proved that floods had come down the main stem of the Columbia. I didn't, you know, I had plenty of evidence up Valley, but when I saw that bar, this shows the extent to which a really colossal flood had come down. So, so the late, late Wisconsin flood did get down. Then, so then the Okanagan lobe starts blocking it off. So what does that do? Well, then that just simply blocks off the Columbia. You still got water that can get into Moses Cooley and Grand Cooley. Um, so I didn't, I wasn't too worried about the uh, volume of water coming. I just thought once you got the Columbia blocked off, then it's going to easily flood Moses. Mm -hmm. So, it, and um, I got a somewhat different opinion once we started doing the two two dimensional modeling as to how much water you can get into Moses. But I didn't. I wasn't troubled by it at that time. And then ice advances farther, blocks off Moses, and so you got Grand Coulee. Um, I mean, Grand Coulee itself too formed, as Brett's uh, pointed out in his 1930 two paper and earlier, you know, so you could picture a cataract starting down at Cooley City marching up. So there's a stage when um, flood floods are coming. I thought it almost had unlimited floods. You know, you had, you had these whole batch during the last Wisconsin and well, there must be similar floods during isotope stage six and eight and 12 and all of that. We, you know, you know you almost, so there wasn't any problem with getting water into Moses one way or another. But the way you, you really have to do it is Grand Coulee can't be fully formed yet. So you have to picture the cataract working its way up to the north, up, up that lower, that, uh, I'm talking about upper Grand Coulee above Dry Falls. Right. Uh, that lower canyon is relatively straight and uh, what is it, about two miles or so wide. I can't remember the width, but it's fairly straight. And then and then uh, when it gets up in the vicinity of Steamboat Rock, only then does it widen out. It's an immense thing. But I, I, you picture the cataract down there at the lower end of it. And at that point, the upper Grand Coulee is going to be relatively unincised. So when water comes into the system then, and Grand Coulee isn't sucking off so much water, it's really easy to flood Moses mm -hmm. Coulee. And that's kind of how I pictured things. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually spill it out, though, and and, and, and and come to grips with it. I didn't really think it through clearly, uh, if, I have, if I have thought it through clearly, until I did that paper, uh, the Roads Less Travel By paper in the, the published in 2021. But I had these ideas in my head about think part pieces of it and you know, small elements of it since the uh, you know probably 71 or two or somewhere in there but it, it took i hadn't really put it together and uh um so, so i i knew anyway i knew that moses was part of the system i wasn't really concerned about it being flooded and once i had 40 floods and or more or 50 or 60 down south uh there wasn't any trouble letting four of them come down Moses. Sure. Um, and um, I didn't have any evidence really that uh, any of this couldn't all happen in late Wisconsin time. I, I really wasn't really concerned about earlier events very much. I had plenty to do with the late Wisconsin. So let the, I, I didn't I didn't really concern myself until the last few years with earlier stuff. I don't know if that answered the question or not. It did. It did. Let's keep it going. We have a, a live viewer named Jim O'Connor. And he asks, how many floods were there? <laughs> Actually, he probably knows the answer to that better than I do. Uh, the, the answer to that um, lies as much as anything in Brian Atwater. Brian, Brian started working up in the sand pool in the, in I guess about 83 or somewhere in there, maybe 82. And um, I, I, I had, I had uh, come across Glacial Priest Lake and uh, Brian and I walked into one uh, into each other's office. We basically showed the same type of stratigraphy, uh, interpreted the same way. Brian in the Sample Valley, me in Priest Valley, and holy smokes, it's a bigger story. And anyway, Brian was really going after the Sample story, and he came up with this marvelous 89, at least 89 floods. And the implication was that he missed some because the bottom of his section was was a was was not well sampled. It was a drill core that fell apart somewhat and uh, didn't really know what's happening down there very much. So there might be more than 80, but at least that number. Hmm. Um, since then, I think you know, just talking with Atwater and O'Connor and 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 Brian's got a nice piece on that field guide, the 19 2001 field guide, put, trying to put together all these sections of different things and how they might hang together. 
Uh, I think we think of 100 floods or maybe a few more than that, uh, depending on how you parse out, uh, uh, out, out things and how many are above the Mount St. Helens ash layer here and there. Uh, I, but over 100. It's Thank certainly you. 100 or 100 yeah. or a few more than that. Very good. Let's do a few more. And viewers, I remind you that, that I think there's at least five weight papers for you waiting, no pun intended, at nicksentner.com. So if you click under the word floods, you'll get to all these papers that Richard's referring to some of these, and those are waiting for you if you haven't read those before. And many of these are behind paywalls and everything else, so it's a chance for you to get your hands on these things that uh, should be freely available to everybody if you ask me. Pat Miller from Yakima, were all the floods essentially the same volume? No. Um... You, know, you you look at a place like Burlingame, um, there's a central part of that section that's, they're all roughly the same size. So I'd say those floods were, pro that was my inference anyway, that when you have this repeating pattern, it takes a similar volume. Uh, in that case, it's it's filling up Pasco Basin and back flooding off Pasco Basin to get get to, get to up Walla Walla to that part of the valley. Uh, so Pasco, it's a valve, there's a narrows at the mouth of the valley. So it has to go through this relative valve to get up there and it so it's, it's sort of chastised you know the water coming out of pasco going through that valve to get up there but yeah i think it takes a similar thing but with down section even there uh, there's, there's much thicker beds at the bottom and up section they're thinner and finer you can certainly see that at brewing game if you look at those photos again the, they get thinner and finer towards the top and i can see the same relative coarsening downward uh thinning and finding upward in every section i looked at that had any size to it um, Brian, I think, came up with the same thing. I, Brian knows his sections a lot more than I do, but uh, it was just a widespread thing. So it seemed to be that you, uh, and we couldn't see the bottom. I never could never see the bottom of the section. So I can only surmise it has to do with the ice sheet. The ice sheet mm. comes in, it, it, it impinges against the uh, Bitterroot Range and, and the glacier lake Missoula is there. But at first, it's going to be a small lake and it's going to dump frequently and it's going to get increasingly bigger. But that's a part of the section I have never seen. Uh, you know, I don't see those floods. I just think, we, I'm not sure we have ever seen them. Hmm. But what you do see is when they get really big, that, I would imagine that that might have been only several floods, early floods that we don't see. But the ice is, you know, it's cramming down in there very fast, fast as ice flows from Canada, smashing in. So it gets to a, a big ice sheet uh, blockage fast. And then a very slow waning. In other words, the ice sheet goes, oh, it disappears very gradually. So as it does, it's, it, it can only form, it, it, you know, when, when the ice is at its max, it forms this lake. And then it might have been, you know, let's say 12 or 15 floods of that size, but then it gets, it shrinks a little bit, so it can't fall quite as big. And it shrinks more and it can't fall quite as big. So you're getting to these sort of uh, medium big floods, and then it yeah. gets to medium sized floods. And then you have to go all the way down. The, eventually the ice shrinks and you're down to these tiny little things. Instead of uh, you know releasing 15 million cubic meters per second, it's it's maybe 500,000 cubic meters per second. The very last couple of floods or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't know these numbers, but right. yes, they're they're all these sizes. I think um, probably nothing as small as a historic Columbia River flood, but right. you know, um, per perhaps starting off and ending in less than mega flood range. Mega flood meaning one million cubic meters per second. And, Thank and in you. Between going, going up to 15 or so. Yeah. Good. Okay. Let's do three more. How about that? Scott wonders how did that bright stuff end up at the top of your slide? So that at the mouth of Moses <laughs> Cooley, how do you get that bright stuff up at the top? Um, that requires um, another flood. So that has to be a, well, first of all, that stuff at the top, it's got giant current ripples on it. So it's clearly a flood deposit. Um, it, it, it is coming down the river. It's got all the lithologies. I can even see my metal rocks in that gravel up there. Um, yeah. It's got all the stuff coming down the Columbia, and it's a flood. So where does that come from? Well, it, I, I, there's, there's evidence of that, a flood at that time uh, in various ways uh, down the Columbia. And you can see it from the mouth of the metal is this giant boulder bar there that I was familiar with when, during my thesis days either. And that, that has to be something coming down. Um, I, for the, for the, I just thought it was Missoula floods for the longest time, but then Brian Atwater disabused me of that idea because he showed in his work that Glacial Lake, after, after his last floodbed in the Sandpoil and other sections, he's got 
um, one or 200 varve beds after that and no sign of a Missoula flood. So he's got Glacial Lake Columbia outlasting the Missoula floods. And so I can't, at that point, this is, this is his 1956, 57, excuse me, 1986, 87 papers. Yeah. And uh, up until that point, or maybe, maybe it was a field guide before that or something, uh, you know, Brian threw a monkey wrench into my story. And so that it was clearly wrong. He was right. So then where, then where are you going to get that flood from? So I can only, the only place, the only water I can see that's big enough to do that. And it, even that doesn't seem big enough, but it has to be Glacial Lake Columbia itself failing. Mm. So Glacial Lake Columbia mm. fails in such a big way that it comes down, makes the boulder bar at the mouth of the Mento, the big boulder bar at Entiat. Um, it, it, when actually it's down in the valley, but across from uh, Pangborn Bar, this uh, one I call, um, what do I call that one? I forget. But anyway, uh, there's this low bar with giant ripples all over it. It's mostly mined away now. Down at West Bar, um, I think West Bar is that flood. It's not a Missoula flood. It's coming down the valley. And then in between is this Moses, uh, Moses Cooley stuff. Now, Moses is interesting because that gravel is very high. How the hell can, can a flood just from Glacial Lake Columbia get that high? The way you would do it is... Uh, the slot, the, the slot, the Columbia is now in. It wasn't that wide yet. You know, the, it, it's managed to cut a slot through, perhaps. Uh, but you got a big bar of gravel there, and so the big flood comes down and encounters the gravel and just, you know, has to has to fill up and go over it. And so that's, I think, how it happens. Hmm. That that the, the, you don't have a quite as wide, or maybe not nearly as wide, a slot through Moses Cooley Bar that the Columbia Valley has now. And so then a, even a you know, a, a flood the size of uh, Glacial Lake Columbia flood can can top that bar uh, hmm. at, at the upper at the upper end of the Moses Cooley bar. Thank you. Uh, our last two questions. Uh, Glenn in Spokane wonders: Did Brett make any comments to you about his relationship with Flint and views of Flint's work? <laughs> I told Nick this, so I will. I kind of saving this for. I I, I, I may be doing a book eventually on those little fights. I'm going to save some of this Brett stuff for that thing, but I'll tell you now anyway. Thank you. Um, so many, one of these conversations I have with Brett, I, I asked him about Flint and he said, well, as a professor at the University of Chicago, I had students that had come from Yale and some of them were telling me about some of the things that Flint was saying about me and my ideas and his lectures at Yale. And, and so um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this, this, this got to be a huge amount of the story they don't know about, but I'm just, anyway, they're writing letters back and forth and, uh, Brett's so, so Flint, so Brett's is getting this insulting material coming back in, in the, in these lectures that he's hearing indirectly from students that have heard these things. And so Flint says, for my, what my part, I would write, um, Flint these letters and in it, I would have these highly passages to him would be highly offensive and uh and then at the end i i draw a, a thin black line through these these sentences and uh so they're technically out of the letter but flint could read every syllable <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he did yeah all right so there's my there's my flint story to answer love the it. question <laughs> love it okay last question is from dk merrick and dk wonders Richard, how do you define the edge to an ice sheet? Like, this is a big deal, right? We're, we've been thinking about the Spokane area, and Flint's got it uh, so far south and on. And, and, I'm, not, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, why do you think there were so many different opinions on where the edge of the ice oh, margin that. was in yes, Spokane? That. Yeah, if I, if, I had, you know, if I had preparing a presentation for this, I would have had some slides up showing this. Um, all right. So, so the, all right. So we're going back to Brett's and yeah. Brett's 1923. Uh, and when his first field season was, was it 22 or 21? Um, anyway, um, one of the places he starts, well, he knows this Thomas Lodge from Spokane and Lodge has been about the thing. Uh, so I don't know how much they went out in the field together and stuff like that, but other people, uh, had been there, uh, 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 Brian, uh, uh, Chamberlain, uh, uh, Pardee, um, and there were various exposures that everybody seemed to agree were till. There were there were south of Spokane, um, 
And, you know, although Brett's in 1923, the second paper is going to break the story of really huge floods. Uh, north of the Scabland, north of where Medical Lake is, uh, it's kind of a flattish plain. Uh, some of these some of these exposures are near Cheney and about that area and farther north. Um, and everybody just seems to think they're till. And Brett's kind of agrees with that. I, don't, I just don't know really what's going on. He, Brett's in one of the paper, might have been the 23 paper, the first one, the place called Pentop, south of Spokane. It was on a rail line uh, that went out of Spokane. I went there finally because there's giant boulders all over the place there. Still are. You can still see them. The rail line's gone, but the current road follows the old rail uh, trolley line it was. And yeah, you could see how the, most people would think this is like like till. So Brett's had in his eye that whole that whole idea was glaciated. And he sort of bought the story that others had uh, ahead of him. And in his very first paper, I think it's 1923A, He's, that's not many illustrations, but one illustration he has, he has this lobe of ice out there. He calls, and eventually calls it the spangle lobe, uh, covering this whole area. Um, and it's in every one of his papers. He never changes that. In 1969, the lobe is still there. It's because of that. Um, you know, in, in 1965, uh, Paul Weiss um, and his colleagues, uh, and he convinces Richmond, I guess, of this too, because Richmond ends up on the paper. They... Uh, that pull the ice sheet back on good evidence uh, uh, that these that these things really many of the things that Brett's and Flint, well yeah Flint 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 made such a map too uh, so Brett's has his ice sheet down there but Flint's got it out even farther on the plateau for the right. same reason yeah. it just looks like till um, I mean later we realized most of these gravel things are just flood deposits but Brett's wasn't you know the master himself wasn't didn't understand all of this yet and. Uh, but he also never comes to grips with that. But, but the convenience of that lobe, and maybe it just it's an impediment the lobe makes, it blocks it, it blocks in Brett's mind any possibility of water coming from the east. That spangle lobe stays there. The floods come out underneath it. He, he's trying to struggle where the water came from though, for the longest time. It's got to come out underneath the ice sheet. It's part of the reason he thinks that is he's got these spangle lobes and these lobes farther west there across the top of the plateau, especially the spangle lobe. Uh, you know, pretty anchored around. It's a, it's a nice, you know, Brett's geomorphology. So you've got a nice geomorphic boundary there to put it in. Um, and he never, but he never removes it and never, never advances the thinking enough to think that Jesus, maybe some of these boulder bars I'm seeing, because there aren't, there aren't boulder bars up there in that plateau that he could see, but there are. And I mentioned him not going flying. Um, you'll never get me up in one of those contraptions. But had he gone out of Felt's Field, out of Spokane, up in one of those contraptions, and looked down where Fairchild Air Force Base later became, it's full of giant current ripples there, and it's conspicuous. So he, he, had he ever gone up in the air, he would have seen, in this area he's got the spangle lobe, that this is flooded. But he didn't go in the air. Hmm. And I'm, I'm, I don't know whether he ever saw aerial photographs of that area, hmm. but they are, they're still there today. I mean, there's been so much bulldozing and everything and ruining things, but those ripples are still there in the, uh, I can't remember if it's east or west of Fairchild, they're spectacular and they're undeniable. And if Brett's had seen them from the air in one of the uh, 1920s contraptions, uh, he would right. have known it too. Right. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, that's plenty. I mean, I can't thank you enough. This has just mm -hmm. been a rare treat and I'm sure all the comments in the live chat will, will confirm what I'm saying right now. This is a, just a huge get to get you into this thing, and I'm so glad we had a chance to, to plug you in right before we're quitting this series. So thank you for your time this afternoon. Richard. Yeah, well, this is good, too. I, Nick, I appreciate your work over the years, too. I mean, you, you bring, you, you, you're, you're sort of a popularizer, but you're also a geologist. And I noticed in giving you talks, you never, you always got the figures right. And if there's a controversy between, let's say, weight and somebody else, you'll, you'll mention the range and not, and often skip the details because it's not relevant to the audience. I just love the way you work this thing. And uh, so I, I think, you know, your, your other series, Nick on the Rocks, what I'd like to do is, uh, is do that. In other words, we get together somewhere and we each bring our favorite bottle of single mock scotch and we okay. talk about geology on the rocks. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love your pun uh, in that series, too, that way. So that's great. Thank you. Well, thank you for those nice words, Richard. And we'll talk to you again sometime soon, I hope. Okay? Thank you much. I'm going to end our Zoom meeting right Adios. now.
Great job today. Thank you. Well, that was Richard Waite, United States Geological Survey. I don't know how you're feeling. From my point of view, that could not have gone better. So, feeling great. Hope you're feeling great. Are we done? No. It's 1.24, and we're about to do a little intermission. But instead of uh, giving you a shout out the window, I'm going to give you a very confusing note to stare at while I take my intermission. So I'm going to take an intermission, but I think I have homework for you. And it's a note that Richard Foster Flint wrote to J. Harlan Bretz, and there's no date on the thing. And I'll be very curious to hear your opinion, if you have strong opinions, of when Flint wrote that note, and then you'll notice that Brett's put his own text below it. I was going to include it in the last show, but it's such an outlier and such a sexy little document that I want us to look at that together. So I forget if that's right now or if I've got a couple things ramping up to that. Give me a uh, let's see, let, let's get over here. Uh, we're done with Zoom. Wow, God, I just, I just didn't know how that was going to work. So what a huge relief. Um, and we're looking at the same thing here, right? Yes, we are. And if I go play, yeah, we can see that. This is the end of the Brett's. <laughs> okay. And yes. Uh, between Richard Waite today and Vic Baker a few weeks ago, we have gotten a chance to visit directly with the two living links to J. Harlan Bretz because both of these well-esteemed geologists made the pilgrimage to visit with Bretz in his home in Hood Homewood, Illinois. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, two or three Thursdays ago, Larry Smith, who's now in Chile, by the way. Larry Smith, you remember that Glacier Lake Missoula show? Larry said, ah, I think I gave you the wrong Garden Gulch paper. Can you post this one? It's got better data in it. So I did that. And then Larry heard from a number of you that his slides were too small. So Larry Smith took the time to send me his slides, and I converted them into a PDF. So this is under the word floods at nickcenter.com, and, and uh, you've got that. So this is just housekeeping. Similarly, uh, the last show with Scott Burns, I heard uh, immediately from Bruce Bjornstad, who emailed two separate papers that corresponded with that topic of buried soils and old floods. And so thank you, Bruce. So both of Bruce's papers uh, also get tied to the uh, episode X with Scott Burns. And <laughs> not to be outdone, so Google Earth by Glenn is officially out of control. So now we've got thumbtacks that are not green. We've got Glenn in Spokane taking all of the Erica Medley locations. Do you remember? So Scott Burns in the last episode had a master's student, Erica Medley. And so Glenn uh, ambitiously went through that entire Medley thesis and used a different colored icon for Medley visiting all the spots, including the, the very old stuff at the Dalles. I'm not kidding that Google Earth by Glenn is out of control. So this is Dick Flint's locations from the Flint papers and where Flint puts his red ice margin. Google Earth by Glenn has another uh, place to look at all the Thomas Large locations. Uh, whoops. And look at this. So this is all uh, everybody. This is Brett's green thumbtacks, Flint red thumbtacks, blue Glen photos, and everything else. So we are going to, oh boy, I forgot I did all this now. So if you go to, I don't want to do it now because I don't want to break things, but if, why does it do that? Why doesn't it go there? 
Um, okay. So in the description, right down below, have you ever gone to a show description, a paragraph of text below a YouTube video? Have you? Well, if you have been wanting to go to all the stuff that Glenn has been doing and plotting all these locations on what he calls now My Maps, which is Google Maps, where you don't need to load Google Earth onto your computer. For the show description today, if you go down right now, there's a couple lines of text that I put in, and then there's like a half a dozen Google Maps by Glenn links to get to all these things. So Glenn is, again, Glenn is officially out of control, and that is a high compliment to Glenn in Spokane. So we're going to continue to give props to uh, Glenn today, uh, but I promise to get to your homework. So I'm, a, I'm sorry to report that uh, the rest of today's episode is 1952. Brett's is out in the field, but we lose our friend Thomas Large in uh, spring of 1951. And uh, there's a bit of correspondence between Large and Brett's in the 1940s, but not a whole lot. Um, and this is instead, so, th so thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for your incredible role that you played in this development. And again, thanks to the Eugene team, Jody and John and others who, who added so much to our series, but we are done with Thomas Large for the series. And we're essentially done with, with Brett's and Flint, although I have to say, we're about to take our intermission. You saw the last show. And all that letter stuff back and forth between Brett's and Flint. I found it very interesting watching the replay and looking at the live chat, which I do every time. I always take it. I always watch the episode at least once in replay, even though it's three and a half hours long. And I, I really enjoy reading all your comments. I found it fascinating that as we were going back and forth between Brett's and Flint, some of you were strongly fav uh, in Brett's camp. You saw Brett's as the sympathetic figure. And many others of you, and I've got this by email too, tons of emails, were uh, Flint sympathizers and thought he was being totally reasonable. And there is no big rift or acrimony. And sure, I'll say it. Surprisingly to me, there were a number of you that emailed me and said, you didn't like what I was doing that I was reading these letters back and forth and all we had were Brett's letters. We didn't have Flint's letters and so I was creating this drama unnecessarily. Thank you for the feedback. I guess all I want to say is that I'm reminding you, maybe you never got this message early in the alphabet. I'm just learning new stuff and workshopping things, oftentimes live and reading things live and making discoveries live with you. And so I really didn't know how many letters I had between Brett's and Flint. And I was just trying to toss in my own narration as I was absorbing it. But it's just me and you were reacting and having your own narrative as you were reading the same letters. So I found it interesting that some of you were like kind of bothered by, by that Brett's large, sorry, that Brett's Flint exchange. And I'm not going to apologize for doing it the way I did it. I like doing things spontaneous. And remember, I, couldn't even, I didn't even know I had the letters until less than 20 hours before the episode. So there'll be some more of that today. Your homework is this. This really is only homework for people who saw the last show. And you know the timeline of Brett's and Flint. Here you go. I'll be back in five minutes. This is Flint. This is Brett's. When do you think that note was sent?
1956, 1956, interesting. Okay, well, that is our subject today. 1956 is the paper that Bretz is about to publish after his 1952 fieldwork. Just scrolling back in real time with you. Okay, interesting. Okay, welcome to the second half of today's episode. I'm going to try my best to keep it moving. My goal is not to have this be another three-and-a-half-hour show, but no promises, okay? Great. The red shirt is off. We can go uh, wherever we want to go. And uh, thank you so much for being with us. Vinman's Bakery and I both say we love you and thank you for being here with us in session Y, many Missoula floods. Okay, boy. Slides. Let's go. I will enjoy seeing your comments later on. So I think we're mostly done with Brett's and Flint, except Thomas in Seattle. I have to tell you this story. So I re introduced this to you a while back, that Thomas is a, at the University of Washington. It turns out that Thomas is a student. Thomas is a couple of years older than me. Mechanical engineer, lifelong, grew up in Ritzville, went to Western Washington University, worked for Boeing, uh, worked in Texas, all these places, high fancy mechanical engineering stuff. And then pandemic happened and he retired and uh, started watching a bunch of these geology things and said, I'm going to go back to school, even though I'm over 60. And so at Thomas at the University of Washington was using his engineering ability to fix some of the rock saws in the geology building at the University of Washington and uh, started to get to know the uh, Quaternary Research Center facility, the ocean building as they call it, I think. I learned all this two hours ago because Thomas visited my house. He wanted to meet Bijou. But more than that, Thomas from the University of Washington drove over this morning and made a personal delivery. So on loan from the University of Washington are these documents. This is the 1956 Brett's map that was sent to Flint, and it sure doesn't look like he ever used it. <laughs> like Flint is kind of out on the whole story by 1956. And we're going to give more, pro well, I'll just continue here. So I'm making sure that you know about Google Earth by Glenn. This is Glenn who came over and visited here in uh, November before Thanksgiving, before we started the series. Oh, no, let me, let me do the, I forget how I did this. I'll give you a sneak peek at the, at the Flint papers that, I, that Thomas brought over to me. And before you get upset, uh, I have it on loan. And I will be returning these Flint documents to the University of Washington um, April 1st? No, May 1st. I want to have them until I, I do those downtown lectures uh, in April. So thank you to Thomas. I took a couple of photos, uh, and those are coming in just a second. But here's the box. Personal delivery. It snowed last night, but Thomas got up and over Snoqualmie Pass. And this is a book that Flint wrote. And Thomas was working uh, this winter and noticed these two file folder um, binders on a shelf. And they're starting to do some reorganization over there. And Thomas was starting to worry that these would be tossed out. Well, they're not going to be tossed out. And both Brian Atwater and John Stone have been uh, involved with these documents, and they know that I get to hang on to them for a little bit. But these, I'm not really prepared to, I don't want to get these under the document camera necessarily, but here they are. You've seen photos of these in past episodes, but delicate documents like this that were owned by Flint and carried around out in the field by Flint a hundred years ago. Uh, I will take very good care of them. And there are a few little very 
lightly uh, written cursive notes in Flint's hand on the maps and the pamphlets. Very fun. Thank you, Thomas. I think there's some slides coming in a second, but I forgot why I organized it this way. So I asked Google Earth by Glenn uh, if he could peek ahead um, a few days ago to the notes of 1952 by Bretts, because Glenn knows these notes better than anybody at this point. Here's Glenn by email. Glenn from Spokane. Google Earth Glenn. Nick, I'm on it. I get as much enjoyment finding all this stuff as you do, so this is fun work. Yesterday, for instance, the dog and I went to downtown Spokane to verify Flagpole Hill that Thomas Large wrote about, quote, a pear-shaped hill next to the tennis courts with granite boulders, unquote. 100 years ago. Yeah, that narrows it down. And the two women who answered the phone at the Spokane Historical Society had never heard of it, but we tracked it down, the dog and I, down in South Hill and Spokane, Minito Park, Small Victories. It's pretty close to John Stockton's house, I do believe. So here's Glenn, who actually sent this to me for the last show, but we didn't get there because of um, the discovery of those Flint letters. Glenn, to all of us, well, Bretz is in 52, Bretz is traveling alone now by car. He's, he's 70 years old. He's got no students. He's retired. And some of the field days uh, and others, he's joined by Smitty, or HTUS. Actually, a guy named Harold Theodore Ur Smith, age 44, who was a geology professor at the University of Kansas at the time. And the two of them debate observations. And this is one of the first times that Glenn that I've seen him having these types of interpretive exchanges in Brett's, in Brett's field notes. Smith co-authors the 56 paper, and for some of the days, they are also joined by George Neff, who Richard Waite mentioned today briefly, of the Bureau of Reclamation. On page four in the typed notes, and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I want to see these notes. I want to see these Brett's notes. No problem. They're at nickcenter.com. Under the word Brett's, they've been there for weeks. Yeah. Same thing. Scanned at the University of Chicago, emailed out here, Natalie, and this stuff hasn't been seen. Is it worth reminding some of you? The letters, the field notes, nobody has seen this stuff. I talked to Richard Waite in one of our AV trial sessions over the last few days. I said, Richard, did you ever go to the University of Chicago? He said, well, yeah. But, I mean, they're only open like 9 to 4 and on a weekday, and, and, you know, there's just so much there, and they wouldn't let you take photos or make copies or anything. So you're, like, hunched over. Like, you knew you are only going to get just a little bit. And so... Why are we able to show all this stuff to God knows everybody? And the answer is we got permission from the Brett's family to do it. So I'm confident when I say nobody has seen all of these field notes. Nobody. Even the most famous Ice Age flood geologist among us today, they haven't seen it. And so folks like Jim O'Connor and others who are Diving in deeply now, and other future researchers, hopefully, they'll be using these notes for years to come. And Glenn is getting a good crack at it with us. Yeah, so we talked about this last time. Brett's is, is in the notes, and even in the paper, as we will see, ripping into Flint. And the, the Riparia Dam, wholly an imaginary thing. I traversed all the roads to see the remnants of high distal parts and the co co uh, conspicuous channels around and across it. I did some footwork and inter-road tracks. Conspicuous nonsense. Channels? No. Not even a trace of river gravel or sand on the thinly loose-covered basalt of the uplands where the delta toe remnants and the bypass channel should be. I found three erratic pebbles in the draw down in the basalt below 1300. Bretz continues to criticize Flint in subsequent paragraphs on the same page. And there's the typed notes themselves that you can get to. Uh, th this is the very low ebb quote that I ended with in the last episode. I'll continue. This is typed up from Bretz's notes directly from 1952. The Great Railroad Pit north of Daru Ranch has two smaller active 
pits in its huge scarp. Both show approximate parallelism between this frontals. Okay, we get it. Clint, uh, Flint can never again accuse me of mistaking one for the other. Okay, yeah, so he's, I mean, there can't be good terms now. I don't know. Well, I, again, it, it bothers some of you to add my own narrative, so I guess I won't. I love this visual. Here's the master himself, as Richard Waite calls him. He's got car trouble. He's stuck in Dayton, Washington. He's waiting for radiator repairs in 1952. He's alone. And he's typing in his, or adding in his notes, I, I got to go back to Shoulder Bar. Maybe now or after Smitty arrives, I've missed something. Google Earth by Glenn. Glenn has read over 1,000 pages of Brett's field notes. And here are the number of the field notes pages by year. More than 1,500 place names. Thank you, Glenn. And I can't hold it. I'm getting a bunch of emails from people saying, what are you going to do to thank all these people who have helped you? It's maybe the same people who say I'm making a mistake by putting it all out there for free. I don't know, but they're like, you have to do something, like send them a certificate or a, a fruit basket or something. Well, thanks for the input, but the reward is the doing. Myself and I, I'm willing to bet Sharon and Glenn and everybody else, all the guests, the reward is doing it, is being part of this community. It's not doing something and then waiting for the reward coming later on. That's just a different frame of mind. So am I sending all sorts of stuff to these folks? I'm not. I'm saying thank you. And we're all in this community together. Maybe I'm reading everybody wrong, but I don't think so. Well, you got a got a cup. Got a got a customized mug from Kirk. So Glenn can make a t-shirt if he wants. I I I spent countless hours making 1500 Google Earth by Glenn sites and all I got is this fucking mug. Sorry, Patrick. Well, here's another to add to the list. So here's Thomas. This photo was taken two and a half hours ago at our house. Thomas got up early, drove over the pass, through the snow, made the delivery. And I told you already that Thomas is a student at the University of Washington. You know, he's just auditing classes. He's, he's retired. But here's the box of the Flint material. And here's his car. And here's an example of Flint writing in the margin of the famous 1928 color map by Brett's, Aaron Waters believes the Telford tract younger than the Cheney tract. So here's this map. I guess it's in this box right here. Should I find it? Should I find the map that, that Flint was carrying with him, the Brett's color field map that, that he was lugging from place to place all through the 1930s? I should, shouldn't I? I, I did see it. Uh, oh, boy. Well, I said I got I got to pick up the pace, and now I'm, I'm using valuable time looking for these old these old maps. Look at this. This is the one with the binder on it. The duct tape keeping it together. Oh, here it is. Here, I'll go to the docky. I'll be very careful, I promise. I don't have gloves on or whatever. To Dick Flint, compliments of Harley Bretts.
Don't tear it. Don't tear it. There it is. It's faded by the summer sun. It smells like it was carried out into the field summer after summer in the 1930s by Richard Foster Flint. But they're wor working on, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll work on getting this stuff carefully photographed and then returned to the University of Washington for safekeeping. I can just hear Cheryl and others who are special collections people like having a stroke that I even have these things. Hope it's not a problem. Okay, pick it up. Pick it up. Let's go. Let's go. So here we go. Shh. Hang on. Sorry. Oh, my God. Concentrate. Let's go. All right. So Google Earth by Glenn. This is Brett's last field season out here. Now, you remember that I was saying a few shows ago, this is the last summer that Brett's is out here, but I would always add in the 20s because summer of 1929 was his last field season in the 1920s. And then he's not out here doing field work all through the 1930s, all through the 1940s, and into the early 1950s. I don't really know, as I really think carefully now and read carefully these field notes in 1952, I'm not totally understanding why 1952 was the year. He's, Brett's is five years into retirement. He retired in 1947. I thought the reason he came out in 52, Brett's, for his last field season was to take advantage of all these new exposures by the Columbia Irrigation Project the Columbia Basin Irrigation Project, Grand Coulee Dam. But when we look at this map by Glenn, he's not really up there. Uh, I guess he's taking advantage of all sorts of new exposures as they put the distribution canals in. Maybe not maybe I'm realizing that in real time. But he doesn't go back to Spokane at all, which is kind of a disappointment to me. And when I was bugging Brian Atwater about the Spokane flood and the Spokane ice sheet thing by email last summer, Atwater's always very nice to, to, to reply on almost every email. Usually it's one or two sentences like, you know, come on. But at some point, Atwater said, well, why don't you go see where, what Brett's thought when he came back out in 52? Maybe he revisited a bunch of these places south of Spokane that he was mapping as till. And that was our last question for Richard as well. Well, he never did. He didn't come back to the one of the most interesting areas for us this entire winter. I don't know why that is, but he didn't. And yet, it's quite impressive. So this is from Sharon. So I won't take the time, but if you go to nicksetner.com and you go under Brett's, you'll see newspaper clippings from Sharon sent this morning involving Bretts in the 1940s and Bretts in the 1950s and so on. Thank you, Sharon. And this photo in one of the newspaper articles I had not seen before. But it's Bretts in 1952. He's out here. He's got his pipe that, that Richard Waite was talking about, and he has his famous, I think it's just in the 50s that he's rocking this hard hat. And so in addition to Jeff from Vinman's visiting about 30 minutes before the episode started this morning, I also got a visit from Grandpa Carl, who drove up from Prosser. And Carl had a gift.
Thank you, Carl. We continue. Let's get to some of the detailed field notes and the details in the 56 paper. Here we go. So we're not reading details of letters. For the most part today, we're reading, well, that's not true. But let's start with some notes. Brett, writing in 1952, George Neff is convinced that there is an older Luss, he pronounces it Lurse, <laughs> in the Palouse, beneath some of the Scabland gravel deposits, to a younger, much mm, overlying these gravels. Now that's interesting to me. This theme keeps coming up of what we see at the surface is worth working with, but this person is convinced there's older stories that are not exposed. Older stories not exposed. I didn't want to interrupt Richard Waite because I thought it was an excellent Bravo performance. But one of my questions is based on Sky Cooley's thought that is it possible there's a bunch in Moses Cooley at the mouth of Moses Cooley that's much deeper than Richard Waite's five beds? How can we get to these things that are buried beneath younger stuff? If there truly is older, bigger, and younger, smaller, have we mostly to this point been preoccupied with the younger, smaller and not getting a chance to see much of the older, bigger? Leave it alone. Uh, gives you a sense. It's hard to read. I'm just going to let you read it on your own if you want to freeze frame that. Um, discussions with Hoover Mackin. I mean, it's almost like we scripted wait now, but we didn't. But he didn't know we were going to talk about this, but we are. So this is different. I know Brett's is 70 now. He doesn't have students with him anymore. But now he's he's got all these discussions in the field with Geologist, I, I assume that he respects. And they're true conversations, which I don't really remember him having in the 1920s for whatever reason. I think this is interesting. J. Hoover Mackin says, Wenatchee Valley never can be held responsible for glacial ice in the Columbia Valley at or near the mouth of Moses Cooley that Ben Page from Stanford is correct in his interpretation of the Wenatchee Valley's glacial history. He thinks immediately, okay, so this is difficult to read, and Brett spilled some water out in the field, everything else in 1952. So let's go to the typed stuff. I mean, how, how am I supposed to read that? Let's go to the typed stuff. Same thing. July 8th, 1952. J. Ho J. Hoover Mackin says Wenatchee Valley never can be held responsible for glacial ice in Columbia Valley. This is Brett's typing this stuff out. At and near the mouth of Moses Cooley. The ben Page is correct in his interpretation of Wenatchee Valley's glacial history. Mackin thinks the hummocky topography that I called moraine is the result of gravel, burial of stagnant ice, whose later melting produced the hummockiness thinks both Rock Island Creek and Moses Cooley yielded the debris for the cover, thinks there is a real and typical till to be seen beneath this gravel. So there is till south of Wenatchee? Whether it's stagnant ice or not, where's that ice coming from if both Mackin and Brett think there's glacial ice at the mouth of Moses Cooley? Is that older, bigger? I mean, I've already told you we're doing a bunch of email chain stuff between O'Connor and Ralph Dawes and many others. That's been the topic the last few days. Brett's loved having old ice advance further south of Polson, Montana than the younger ice, blue bigger than red. By email, I'm saying, why can't we have blue bigger than red coming down the Columbia? Is that blue ice that gets south of Wenatchee? And just before I sound too crazy, 
it sounds like these guys are saying the same thing, or at least they're talking about ice of some vintage south of Wenatchee. Uh, where, where did I stop there? Uh, Mackin thinks the possibility that a long, narrow Columbia Valley glacial tongue may have reached down this far from Chelan. <laughs> My God, nobody's saying that today says he can make little out of the Columbia Valley physiography from Wenatchee to Chelan. Mackin believes in a Columbia Valley flood as apart from the Scabland flood, but thinks it may well have entered from Moses Cooley. Says the big mound at Moses Cooley mouth is really a Columbia River bar, has much granite debris. Mackin suggests backset bedding as an explanation of the Burke pit inclined layers. Okay, we don't have the backstory for that. Let's skip over it. This is a portion, selfishly, this is a portion of the channeled scab lands that I'm most interested in because it's the closest to my backyard. Like the Ice Age floods never came through my valley here in the Kittitas Valley, for sure. But a little more than an hour drive from my house, I can get to Wenatchee and I can get to these rather significant puzzles that I think remain. I know Richard Waite propelled us forward with some of his slides and his discussion and all of his papers, but I think even Waite would agree there's major unsolved mysteries in the stretch of the Columbia Valley between Chelan and Wenatchee. I'm into it. Here's Brett writing in his journal, 1952. He's like, let's just, let's just break this down. Let's just come up with a basic sequence recorded along the Columbia River on the west side of the Quincy Basin, which is south of Wenatchee. Number one, okay, we make some Columbia River Valley to approximately the present dimensions. Okay, that's interesting. Erosion of tributary valleys and gulches on the slopes. Number two, fill that old Columbia River Valley to 1,300 feet at least with granitic sand, and that's up to 500 feet thick. Three, erosion of much of that fill. Is he in the Ice Age yet, or is this pre-glacial? Four, Scabland, Scabland, so okay, so now we're doing for sure Pleistocene Ice Age flooding. Scabland making on ledge west of Babcock Ridge from 1,200 feet up to 13,500. 13, and that's the older Scabland. Remember, Wade was talking about that today. Five, interval of weathering to age this Scabland. That's interesting. Now we're into major amounts of time passing between the older story and the younger story. Six, A, second scab land making on the ledge at a lower elevation. Six, B, crater potholes and Frenchman cataracts operating. Six, C, deposition of torrent debris in Trinidad Terrace. If you're watching from Spain, this doesn't make sense. I'll try to keep moving. Six, D, Moses Cooley operates. It's Mid Valley Mound Bar, two and a half miles west of Trinidad. I got to say it, just a few months ago in October, I spent a very memorable weekend with Brian Atwater, Jerome Lessman, and Joel Gombiner, the, the four of us, and Karen from the Colville tribe, archaeologist. I made a video from there. And I, to be honest, can't remember right now if I included it in the video or not. I don't think I did. It was just at breakfast. I think we were like, where would you go? What are some spots in the Scablands today that might hold some really interesting answers that we just don't have yet? And Jerome Lessman, who will be on the final show on Sunday, he said, I think one of my favorite spots that I would want to spend some time in is the mouth of frickin' Moses Cooley. Well, here's Brett's, his last serious field season out here, and he is also thinking about the mouth of Moses Cooley and those relationships. There's a lot going on, timing-wise, south of Wenatchee. He goes on. Seven, reversal of potholes discharge. Burke gravel deposits. Yeah, okay, again, we're not ready. Uh, or we never are ready this winter, I guess, unless we do it on Sunday. West Bar giant ripples under 500 feet of water. Beverly Bar under eight. Columbia River laterally plains of Trinidad deposits to make a terrace. The least certain as to the portion in this sequence is a reversed flow at potholes. It apparently could have been four cataract. Okay, we're, we're, 
admittedly, we're into inside baseball here, and just a few are following this, so I want to keep it moving. Brett's to himself, I wonder if July 9th doesn't mark the day that I caught the right interpretation. The western waterfalls, like Frenchman Cooley and Potholes Cooley, must be older than the earliest channeling headed for Drumheller, and therefore belong to the first flood, the Warden Othello Bar Cash Butte flood. And then the older Trinidad Scabland is a record of still earlier floods, the only one where there is good evidence for a long interval between floods. You're like, I'm about to click this thing off, okay? I'm, I have no idea what's going on. I feel your pain. I have that feeling regularly, even if I reread things over and over. I'm just giving you glimpses of the field notes. I'm going to, in a moment, give you glimpses of the 1956 paper based on the 1952 notes. So there was quite a delay between being out here and then actually publishing the paper. But I think it should be clear to you by this point, Bretz is off of the Spokane flood. He's off of the idea that there was one major flood and one minor flood that's younger. He literally says it in an excerpt from the paper coming in just a second. So he's entertaining multiple floods that he didn't have back in the 20s. Now, is he abandoning everything with the Spokane ice sheet? No, he's not. But is he getting off of one major dominant Spokane flood? It's safe to say yes if we're willing to read the notes and the paper from the 1960s, 1950s. Keep it fast. Go fast. Moses Cooley, Columbia Valley with George Neff. There's a 900-foot mound at the Moses Cooley mouth. Contains nothing but basaltic gravel. Mackin, J. Hoover Mackin, to the contrary, notwithstanding. He's still calling it a moraine to the north of the mound, and it's covered with basaltic cobbles and small boulders. Not one erratic was found. Neff and I found an excellently expressed moraine ridge. Many helix and undrained depressions. Now, Richard Waite, an hour ago, said that they were walking over giant current ripples. They didn't even know it. But here in these 1956, 52 notes, uh, they got depressions adequate to conceal a Packard car until Brett's and Neff almost stumbled over it. I propose to get a complete basaltic cover, 900 feet, blah, blah, blah. So, yes, you can go here. You know that by now. You can go here and read all this stuff on your own. And I know that some of you do that. And that is so gratifying to see so much follow through from so many of you. But I want to try to keep this going. Okay, I am going to read a letter. I'm going to read it fast, I think. But now we're two field seasons past 1952. We're into the summer of 54, I think. Don't have a date on this letter. But this is from the Brett's archive. And Brett's is writing to Henry Aldrich who I think is in charge of publishing the map and the paper in 1956. And I, this is behind the scenes on what Brett's is hoping to get out of this last major paper. There is a paper coming in 1969, but this is really the last paper based on field work. Go fast. Dear Henry, under, this is Brett's writing, under separate cover, I am shortly sending you manuscript and illustrations for my new paper, New Data with Old and New Interpretations, by Bretz, Smith, and Neff. Completion has been greatly delayed by Smith's slowness to finish his critical reading and to submit suggestions for alteration of the manuscript as I wrote it. However, it has been definitely improved by the delay. Maybe the title's too long, more concise. Maybe you just call it Channeled Scabland, New Data and Interpretations. That's what they ended up going with. Henry, I'm not at all satisfied with the map. It's the best, however, that we could do in black and white on that scale. For convenience in handling by a reader, it should not be larger, and the only alternative is a map in color. I am sending a copy of the colored map that I did back in 28 for comparison. 
Our map contains numerous essential revisions, which, however, increase the detail that has to be in the zip tone patterns. Because this pattern will end all reasonable, oh, wow, because this, pa this paper, this 1956 paper, will end all reasonable controversy over the origin of the scab land in Washington, cocky, I will be, it will be, and will be the basis for future special or more detailed Pleistocene studies in the region. And because the Scabland problem has been well publicized by numerous writers during the past 30 years, it seems to us that it should have the best map of the region ever published. It probably will be the last one of the entire region. We think it should be printed in color. I have worked over the manuscript to make it as readable and readily understandable as possible. The chief, chief difficulty for most readers will be to visualize its aerial geography. To assist them, I've included many smaller maps, sketches, and aerial photos. We think everyone is essential if a final conviction among geologists is to be secured. I have also made numerous cross-references in the text and have inserted many references. Although this manuscript is long, we do not believe that any subdivision or many paragraphs can profitably be omitted. However, I guess we will listen to suggestions for condensation. He goes on, he's worried about the length. He doesn't want to have somebody reject the paper because it's too long, but he really wants it be, to stay as is. Under the summary of original interpretations, we say that field evidence for the flood concept must include a demonstration that a that a general, you guys are always better than I am. You always type in what it actually says. General something never existed, and that ice jams left no detectable records of their actual existence. I shall be greatly surprised if any of that hard-boiled critical group of 1927, the ambush, he's still smarting, will now dare challenge our demonstration. The, le the letter goes on. There's a definite value in crisp, brief reiteration and principles and early conclusions when presenting no novel views. Established uh, patterns of geographic thinking must be laid aside when considering the Scabland region. There is another valid excuse for the length of the manuscript. Also, the story is somewhat complicated and full of detail. To help the reader keep his place in that story, we have been prompted to make brief citations of considerable field evidence from Brett's earlier papers, Third Person Thursday, that Allison and Flint and many other critics had forgotten or ignored. All of this adds to its length, but definitely to the value of the presentation. Still another reason the thing is so frickin' long is that Smith says, I think we need some sort of summary of the original interpretations. I'm satisfied that all of these will greatly help a reader unfamiliar with the region and its problems, and I'm glad that he insisted. Yeah, this thing is a manifesto. The 1956 Brett's paper is a manifesto. It's, it is long, but it's beautifully done. And full disclosure, I still haven't read the thing as carefully as I'd like to. Most of my attention last summer was to the 1920s papers. And I still really haven't totally, because I don't have a lot of time this week to read it as carefully as I want. But I think if you have been with us long enough in this series and you know the main characters and the main storylines, I think that you will get a lot out of the 1956 paper. It is beautifully done. And yes, spoiler alert, there is a color map. He got his way. I am, as you see, attempting to forestall unfavorable comments from the critical readers you may select on the length of paper. The magnitude and extraordinary character of the Scabland history has grown on us. There is no piece of descriptive geology to be put on record and later fitted by some general into a larger picture. It is a complete unit in itself. For this reason, I elaborate the Lake Missoula part of the account, subsequent to making a first draft, 
One, because it's an integral part of the story, like Missoula we're talking about. Two, because we had enough data to submit on that part of the picture. Lake Missoula needs more study, granted. Alden's contributions are fragmentary, and some are definitely an error. Now he's throwing shade. The society might possibly, in the near future, receive application for a grant to cover a season on Missoula alone. What's he talking about, himself? We would like to have the manuscript read critically by competent geomorphologists, if you can find any, who have never committed themselves as favoring any of the three interpretations discussed repeatedly throughout the manuscript. I am therefore listing for your guidance. Okay. Here's who you should give this thing to. I'm sorry, I'll just read it. I am therefore listing for your guidance the geologists who have expressed opinions but are not in the bibliography. If you feel that someone in the list seems to be a logical reader, we would hope that he comes from the anti-flood group. We are that confident of our interpretation of the field evidence. Almost everyone who knows the Scabland problem from field contact is already committed to one of the hypotheses advanced in the past. He's talking about Flint and Allison and himself, basically. Lighten was the first ever to see them as glacial streams and believes I am right. This is Brett Stocken. Rich saw some of the country with Flint and yet believes in the flood theory. Mackin says that to understand the Scabland, one must forget all he ever learned about books from books about rivers. Aaron Waters, born and brought, brought up on the plateau itself, said that we would find at least four floods recorded. He's got a bunch more. Like, here's Davis. They were convinced. Leverett thought Flint was right. Hobbs thought Hobbs was right. Both are... <laughs> Hobbs thought Hobbs was right. Both are dead. Mines are in Mansfield, both very, skept very definite skeptics. They're also dead. Alden Early did not agree with me, but later in conversation said that all that water had to come from Lake Missoula. Pardee Early did not agree, but later published on the giant current ripples on the floor of Lake Missoula and ascribed them to a catastrophic bursting of the lake's ice dam. Long ago, Galuli was quite vocal in condemning my hypothesis. Hodge has his own interpretation, a rather confused succession of events, asserted without supporting evidence. None of us who have been with him on Scabland trips have ever felt that he had, was adequately objective. I mean, he's going through every person. I guess I'm, I'll let you read it and freeze frame it if you want. Man, okay. Two illustrations in addition to the general map need a word. Figure one from a raise map was granted us by the author if we will reproduce it on something bigger than, better than zinc. The copy accompanying the manuscript should be reduced to page length. Ray says copper. Wouldn't colotype be cheaper and satisfactory? I mean, Brett's is demanding here, right? Particular, finicky. I kind of like that. Plate 17 has been ordered from inspection of a mosaic, but has not yet arrived. A photo of part of the mosaic is substituted temporarily. Okay, how are we doing? Kind of different. We're reading old-timey stuff. That was a letter, but it's not a letter exchange. It's just Brett's trying to get this very, very substantial paper, really his final word on the matter, in a form that he is proud of. And he does get there. but I can't hold it. I've got to add my own two cents. I see a different Brett's now. I'm not going to go back to the Flint stuff. You have your opinions about that. He's got a whole group of geologists that are pushing back against him, but it's all cordial. And it's a working group. Now, what has changed? Was Brett's always like that with geologists that he didn't have personal baggage with? Remember, Flint was his former student. And I'll use Aaron Waters as an example, who I wasn't anticipating including in this series. 
But these letters from the University of Chicago are interesting between Brett's and Aaron Waters. So this is maybe the last character that we're introducing in this series, in the penultimate episode here this afternoon. This is Aaron Waters, who truly did grow up in Waterville Plateau. That's just so perfect. In Waterville, Washington. He's a farm kid. Bright. Uh, I don't know much about his background, but I know he taught at Stanford for many years. Talk about Aaron Waters. But there was a very healthy back and forth by letter between these two guys because Waters kept going back to Washington, his home state. And in addition to being a petrologist and many other claims to fame, he couldn't avoid this Pleistocene stuff. He loved it too much. So let's continue with a few letters between Waters and Brett's. And by this time, uh, Warren's, uh, Waters has left Stanford, and he's now at uh, John Hopkins University in Baltimore. January 19th, 1955. Dear Doc, though not convinced of some interpretations, I like this much better than the earlier version, which ultimately became his 1956 paper. Quincy Basin is complicated. I feel pretty sure that in pre-glacial time, it must have looked something like the Yakima Valley around Ellensburg does today, and perhaps in it is recorded the same kind of complex history of alluviation, terracing, warping, and pediment formation with local drainage changes induced by warping and by different spillovers from the grading gravel and sand sheets that we find in the Yakima-Ellensburg region. This goes back to before Thanksgiving, remember, when you and I were talking about pre-Ice Age drama. Still later come the glacial floods, which modified earlier deposits and spillovers, making it very difficult to distinguish glacial features from preglacial. Brett's, I don't think you're quite fair to Meinzer's idea of warping. All these channels are approximately on strike along the flank of Table Mountain Fold. This is just north of my backyard now, everybody. The base of the big basalt flow, blah, blah, blah. So I just like the idea that Waters is pushing back and guiding him a little bit. And, it, and Brett appears to be uh, agreeing or having a good relationship with Waters. Here's Brett to Trowbridge, who I don't know. I don't, Dear Trow, many thanks for your careful reading of our Scabland manuscript. What do you think about the map? It's still in black and white. Not great. Um, I enclosed a copy of an early map, same scale, but in color back in 1928. It's far more readable, as you may recall. It was published by the American Geographic Society. That was the Isaiah Bowman thing. But that patriotic organization melted down all the old plates during the war, and so destroying all chances of the GSA getting and revising that original. Isn't that interesting? World War II intervened, and so making new versions of the old 28 map not possible anymore. Uh, let me grab a couple things here that I thought was interesting. Another study is underway by George Neff deals with the earlier records of glacial water in Quincy Basin and adjacent Columbia Valley. Another by Carey, a student of Mackin's, deals with the giant ripples. This is 1955. I doubt if we will see a restudy by Flint or Allison, but the argument that Plate 1 will be a base map for any and all future stu studies is, I believe, a pointed one. If you agree with me, will you write Henry a strong plea as you feel justified in making? Plant one should be a map in frickin' color. And Waters did the same thing. A bunch of them were all lobbying to get this thing done in, in, in uh, color. Back to Waters. Brett's now. Dear Aaron, typing of the final copy is going along well. And I can't provide you with the carbon, but I can give you the carbon you read for your use in the field. It will be messy but legible. I surely hope you get out to the plateau this coming summer, Aaron. If you haven't see, yet seen the Great Northern Railroad cut in Luss, two miles north of Harrington on Highway 7, be sure to study it. We thought we could identify eight calcified levels in the 30-foot section. Sky Cooley, have you been there? 
but sure also, if possible, to make contact with George Neff. He knows Quincy Basin environments like the back of his hand. Aaron, I hope you can clear up the Telford Crab Creek history. You have indicated tentatively that it got a cleaning off of late Luss that Cheney Palouse did not get. This is difficult for me to accept until you find incontrovertible evidence. Best regards, J. Harlan Bretz. Dear Doc, this is Aaron Waters. The old marked-up manuscript will be fine for my purpose if you can spare it. I shall definitely get to the plateau this summer, but how much time, if any, I can spend in fieldwork on the palouse Luss scabland problem remains to be seen. It's quite possible that I'm wrong about scouring out of Telford Crab Creek sub subsequent to Cheney Palouse. About all I have to go on are my field notes that date back to the summer of 1928. Here are some excerpts. Page 20, Post Spokane Luss covers the floor of Lynn Cooley, Bowers Cooley, and Rocky Cooley to depths of as great as 10 feet. Farrier's Cooley is similar. The coating is thicker and coarser than on the Cheney Palouse track, but perhaps this is because a closer proximity to the source. And he talks about another channel. These relationships are confusing, Harley. In the small channels directly to the north, I could find absolutely no definite scarping of the pyroclastic rich luss. And there are mounds and rock basins filled with luss on the coulee floor. Is this filling due to local wind drift and surface wash since Wisconsin time? The relationship of this crap to the scab, and my typist didn't like that word crap, the relation of this crap to the scabland channels is very difficult to work out. Here I get contrary answers. There are hundreds of mounds of pyroclastic rich luss on the Telford tract, although the deposits do not seem to be the absolute general feature that I was of the Cheney Hooper track. Brett's is probably okay. The highway north of Rockland leads through Scabland with a soil cover up to four feet thick and quite uneroded for the most part. Parts of it have been eroded into beautiful elongate mounds. You can see from the above that I was far from sure of the relationships back in 1928, and I've seen little of that uh, part in the area since. And since the above was written in the field, I have acquired a lot of petrographic data on samples from this region. Okay, I like Waters. He's competent, but he's not super brash and insisting on his way. I think this is Waters too, and I think I'm including it. Why? It's long. I'm including it. Uh, we're running long. Um, what else is new? I don't think I have that much left if you're running out of gas. I like Aaron Waters. I'm just starting to get to know him a little bit. But this is a nice letter, and it not only demonstrates discussion, healthy discussion between two consenting adults, but he's touching back on some of the themes that we've had this winter. So let's try it. September, of 19, September 23, 1955. This is still before the 56 paper is published. Dear Doc, this summer slips away so rapidly that I've returned from the field with several things left undone. One thing is that I did manage to spend a few days around the head of Telford Crab Creek. The relations there are even more complex than I had suspected. After making a map, copy of which will be sent to you as soon as I can get it drafted up, I believe the following interpretation is somewhere near the truth. As you correctly inferred, most of the tract is similar in development to the Cheney Palouse and it seems to be about the same age. Both are covered either by mounds or by patchy sheets of youngest unit of Luss. So even he's like, yeah, if you get confused, just go back to Brett's and you'll have it figured out. However, along the full length of the Lake Creek Channel and over a wide area at the head of the track, the youngest Luss has been removed. I believe that during the last glaciation, a lobe of ice advanced down the north-south part of the Columbia Valley but stopped a little south of Lincoln and did not push up to the top of the plateau. At this time, one of the floods from Lake Missoula, perhaps the last one, 
came down the Spokane Canyon was temporarily obstructed sufficiently by the ice mass in the Columbia Valley to stop around the south end of the ice between Creston and Lincoln and remove all of the loose in this local area. A little of the water spilled over the divide and temporarily reactivated the Lake Creek Channel. Apparently, the flood quickly broke up the front of the ice lobe, allowing the water to go westward through Grand Coulee. You can see what this is all about much more clearly when I send you a copy of my field map. About a month ago, I spent an interesting day with Neff. He showed me his evidence for thinking that a flood from the Columbia overtopped parts of Babcock Ridge and spilled into Quincy Basin. This is a big problem. Perhaps it would be better if you omitted the brief reference in it, of it in your manuscript and you and Neff wrote it up in a separate paper later. As it stands now, your reference to the deposits at Burke sound a little wild, and I thought they were much less convincing than some of the other features that Neff showed me. As a matter of fact, I'm not completely sold on this interpretation anyway. But there is certainly some puzzling evidence. Possibly I may be able to bolster your case with some lava dams in the Columbia Gorge that would help cut down the amount of water necessary to overtop the ridge. We have three main lava dams in that area, and one of them would be about right, about the right height. If Jim O'Connor is still with us, he might be interested in this. One final scrap of fieldwork that may interest you is that I looked at the localities which Flint described as Till near Freeman and Micah, south of uh, Spokane. My interpretations are very different from Flint's. One, the stuff is not Till, but is lag boulders of strictly local derivation, left by the deep weathering of granite, schist, and pegmatite in pre-Pleistocene time. Two, the material that covers the supposed Till is not the youngest unit of the Palouse, which was Flint's unconsolidated Luss, but is a well-consolidated and thoroughly weathered unit found at the base of the Palouse Luss series. Loonsbury and I have completed most of our paper, which I don't know about, by the way, but the Scabland problem is still not written up and have most of the illustrations yet to do. We ought to have it in your hands for critical reading about Christmas. Aaron. Okay, this is the last thing between Brett's and Aaron Waters. Cursive. This is Brett's. <laughs> Interesting. I'm sure this is to Waters, though. Aaron, your argument for late functioning of Lake Creek Channel seems sound. The extensive cleaning up of Lake Luss at its headwaters seem to indicate a real flooding rather than a meltwater river from the Columbia lobe above. There's a reason I'm bothering you with this, but if you have no definite record of the Columbia lobe south of Lincoln at this late date, I suggest that you, oh boy. Hmm, the known late version of the upper Grand Coulee by the edge of the Okanagan lobe. Summit of Steamboat Rock as the blockade causeway for the Lake Creek discharge. Okay, I'm slowing down because it's hard to read number one. I'm not sure this is in print anywhere. I guess it must be in the 56 paper, but I haven't seen it quite yet. And there are some, some themes that are emerging quite late in this series. That Polson, Montana thing and the Wenatchee, Washington thing that Brett's keeps going back and forth between. And then some of the other themes involving Spokane that we've been talking about. But I'm bothering with this because he's back to, Brett's is still back to talking about Spokane and even the Columbia Valley, I think. Let's try. However, I'm still at a loss to explain the bypassing of the Cheney Medical Lake channel heads. They are as low as some even lower than the lowest altitude I have for the Telford Creston Divide Scabland. Even if you could get the old surviving off the Luss with locally supplied meltwater, erosional water from Lake Missoula 
we would still have to explain the lack of a comparable late scouring of the Cheney-Palouse channels by contemporaneous discharge with the Spangle Lake. Only by holiday, only by holding the low back. Okay, forget. I can't. I can't do it. But we're right back. We're right back to these channel heads south of Spokane, and how you get water into the heads of the Cheney Palouse and the Telford Crab Creek, if the bottom has been cut low with the opening of the Grand Coulee. It all comes back to that. I'll be curious what the, the, the geologists on the last show will want to talk about, but I'm guessing we'll be back to these themes once again. Okay, I can't do it. So here you go. It worked. And at nickcenter.com, you have a beautiful PDF just of the map that you can blow up quite a bit, which I'm going to do with you right now. But this is the 1956 color map. All that lobbying on behalf of Brett paid off. Guess who still has the Mondovi horseshoe in 1956? Guess who still has his approximate ice margin? his approximate drift border south of John Stockton South. Yes, Brett's. As Richard Waite just said, as Richard Waite said today, he never did get off of this ice over Spokane. Waite said it today. Even in 69, frickin' J. Harlan Brett still has ice over Spokane. So I hope you can see by now why the second half of this alphabet has been that main question. What the hell happened to the Spokane Ice Sheet? It's on these maps until the end. Beautiful map. And orange, interesting choice. Uh, and you can go to this map and see all these details. This is the Withrow Moraine, and this is the head of Moses Cooley, and the Palisades, and the Bacon Siphon, and all that. Okay, just a little glance, but you know you have the whole paper to look at. August 56, the thing is finally published. Four different explanations. We're going to go through all four explanations, and then we're going to rip them to spread. Uh, we're going to rip three of them to shreds, says Brett's. In print. These aren't my notes now. This is a published paper. Uh, this paper is based on the execution of a long-cherished plan by Brett's to restudy the region with the later rival interpretations in mind. The Great Columbia Basin Irrigation Project has made new data available from the extensive new excavations, and we got new detailed maps as well. The field work was carried out with three men working together as a check on a ruling theory tendency. Thank you, Glenn. There are the field sites of 1952, including waiting for the radiator to be done at Dayton. The final accepted theory for the origin of this assemblage must consider the entire area. The elephantine character of the channel scablands demand more than cursory inspection. He's still begging people to go out there. More than detailed study of limited portions. One major phase of the record never before adequately treated its topography, composition, and structure of the channel scabland region deposits. The leading theme of the pre present paper. I botched that. And structure of the scabland river deposits. The leading theme of the present paper. Aaron C. Waters, well acquainted with the Scabland, wrote the authors that, quote, the best thing you can do to convince your reader is to beg, cajole, even browbeat him into really looking at the region's topographic maps, end quote. J. Hoover Mackin, also well con conversant with the field, said that to understand the Scabland, one must throw away textbook treatments of river work. A doubting but open-minded reader is hereby warned. Maps are repeatedly listed for his critical examination. Well, guess who has acknowledgments in a paper for the first time? Brett's. Is it just because he's working with two other guys? He never had acknowledgments before in his papers. 34 field days in 1952. 
Waters, Woodford, Trowbridge critically read an early draft of the paper. Smith accepted the role in the field of skeptic for all identifications and interpretations. Bretz admits that he served well. However, for the statements in this paper, unless qualified, there is unanimity among, of opinion among the three authors. A reader familiar with Bretz's early publications will find several revisions of interpretation in this paper, the most striking one being abandonment of the term, the Spokane Flood, and a demand by all three authors for several Scabland floods. Obviously, the present paper cannot be simply a series of assertions and denials. Field evidence must be presented. So I, there, there's maybe some of you right now who've been with the whole series, and you just read that with me, and you're like, well, this winter was a waste of time. How many letters were we talking about the Spokane flood? And now the guy says, never mind. I was wrong. Well, let's read it again. I don't think he's saying that. You can have a difference of opinion with me, for sure. It's encouraged. But when I read this again, the most striking uh, revision is my abandonment of the term Spokane flood and a demand by all three authors for several Spokane floods. I think he's just saying we had many floods. We just didn't have one. And I'm not sure that statement says forget about water coming directly from the Spokane ice sheet. I don't think he's saying that. So even with this statement, maybe you're thinking I'm being unreasonable. But I think it is still worth thinking about older, bigger, younger, smaller. Older, blue, younger, red. Recognition of the occurrence of successive floods, the earliest recorded only in the Columbia Valley, the second involving perhaps the entire area. Now, maybe that's the Spokane flood. The later ones restricted to channels already deepened, and the last one again limited to the Columbia Valley. Let's read that one again. Because possibly our color scheme that we've been working on could be plugged into each of those as a, we're just playing with it, idea. That'd be fun. Let's try. Recognition of the occurrence of several successive floods, the earliest recorded only in the Columbia Valley. Brown, how about? The second involving perhaps the entire area. Blue. The later ones restricted to channels already deepened. Red. And the last one, again, limited to the Columbia Valley. Red. He rips into Flint. We don't need to do it again. Flint said this. He's wrong. Mm, wrong. Harmonizing these facts with Flint's concept is quite impossible. I mean, it is kind of bold in a published paper to just keep singling out these folks and saying they're wrong. Like, it seems kind of unprecedented that way. It's not just once or twice. In the field notes, I understand. In a published paper... I don't know. Pardee talked about ripples, sudden failure, Glacial Lake Missoula, calculated the discharge, unusual currents. That was a fine example of understatement. Flint's arrow went, wide, <laughs> went widest in its mark at a place where Allison specified an ice jam. Okay, you get the idea. Flint said this. Flint's mechanism breaks down utterly. He said something here, and then unfortunately he missed seeing a dry fall. It's 300 feet high. <laughs> God, it's merciless. Okay, especially because it's running very long here, I'm going to blow through this next part. But in addition to the Chelan to Wenatchee or Chelan to Vantage stretch of the Columbia Valley, which is a favorite area of mine, 
in the past and continues to be fascinating to me. I think there's two other areas that I'm going to be making field videos all spring. That's my plan. I'm not sure, but I want to keep coming back to Chelan down to Vantage with all these things we've been learning together. I want to get over and make a bunch of field videos in the Spokane area, and I've been hearing from more and more Spokane geologists who are willing to help out. I appreciate that. And then if I can swing it, I want to go over between Sand Point and Spokane in the Ralph Drum Prairie. And so a bunch of the resources for today's program tie to that Ralph Drum Prairie, which I continue to be confused about, but there's enough thought written out here in 1956 that I want to go I want to keep going in that direction. So he's got a whole chronology about Missoula and I'm just going to I'm going to blow over it. Okay? I'm going to blow over. I was going to go all this I'm not going to. He he stresses that it, it's reconnaissance over there. He's got pretty unoppressive map I must say. The spangle lobe, he still got it in place. But I know jack about this area. And all the imagery and the posters that are waiting for you, like this one. Just the fact that you have, you don't even have a river. You don't even have a stream through most of this Rathdrum Prairie. And the Spirit Lake, Twin Lakes, Hayden Lake, Coeur d'Alene Lake, all these lakes are like lined up like, like spectators at a parade. Like the parade's coming down through here and all these lakes are lined up along the, the curbs. Such a weird setup. And a bunch of you are way ahead of me with understanding the basics over here, but there's been a bunch of work done all through the 1900s, including by Brett's. I just need to get over there and go one step at a time. So this poster awaits for you. Ken from Sandpoint sent it to me. Thank you, Ken. And they even have units like glacial outwash and then catastrophic gravel, catastrophic flood sand. This is a publication by three people I don't know. They've got cross sections to the raft drum and all these secrets buried w beneath. So this is all from the 56 paper. I guess I'm, I'm out of gas. And if I'm out of gas, you must be out of gas too. They're still talking about Flint. God. Uh, <laughs> Flint considered the Rastrum Prairie a portion of the Purcell Trench fill as the still intact surface of the original fin. He's probably wrong about that too, huh, Jay, Jay Harland? Oh, yeah, I just went. I went I, I, there's a lot. It's a seriously impressive paper. And so, Flint never came back. I stopped thinking about Flint after the 1930s. Will I spend any time trying to decide what happened to Flint? Where Flint chose to go in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s? Did he ever pull a Brett's and come back and do another paper after retirement? I don't think so. Maybe. But looking at this map that Brett's sent him in 1956 and having the creases still nice and fresh indicates to me that Flint was done with coming out. And I think there is, I can learn from some of you, but I think there is some urban legend stuff about Flint writing textbooks and refusing to put anything about the Ice Age floods in the, in the Geology 101 textbooks all through the rest of his life. Uh, there, there's more of those stories, I think. I don't know them very well. And so, dear viewer... 
We only have one more episode left. And the three kings of comedy will be with us all together. All four of these heads will be on screen together. And I don't know how we're going to do it. I think we're going to email between the four of us a little bit between now and Sunday morning. But each of these cats have been watching the series, each episode. Some of them might be with us still, live right now. And so we'll go wherever they want to go. I think by email so far they've said uh, they'll do what I want to do, but I, it's just the opposite. Um, I have no doubt that we will be talking about future work, current work. We might reflect on the series a, a fair amount. We might react to certain things that have been done more recently in the alphabet. There might be slides and special custom colored things created by some of these guys. We'll just, we'll just see. We'll see what we end up feeling like doing. But I'm confident that our last show will be a nice, tidy way to finish up this Ice Age Flood series. If there's one thing I want to do on Sunday, it's that I want to talk a little bit about the 1960s and the work of Jerry Richmond and how he was trying to correlate these different glacial events across the Pacific Northwest and into the Rocky Mountains. But beyond that, we'll do what these guys want to do. Jerome Lessman, Sky Cooley, and Joel Gombiner all together on our episode this coming Sunday, February 18th at 9 a.m. Pacific time. A toast to you. Here's to you for being here at the end of this very long session, Session Y, called Many Missoula Floods. Here's to Richard Waite for his time and energy being with us live from his office at the United States Geological Survey in Vancouver, Washington. Thank you, Richard. Here's to all of you who have contributed large and small things to this series. It's a true community, and it's been a delightful thing for me personally, and I hope we can do it one more time on Sunday morning. Are we at the three-hour three mark? We must be. But this is not three and a half hours. Um, le okay, let me say goodbye to you, and then a little bonus coverage, let's go through some of Flint's stuff on the document camera, okay? And so to you, I say thank you for joining us today for this episode. Best wishes to you all. I hope this has been a very positive and healthy place for you to spend a few hours. Live or in replay. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. Hey, everybody. Okay, so Flint's book, one of the books that he wrote, I suppose. Let's look at it under a document camera. Hand delivered by Thomas from Seattle, Washington this morning. Professor of geology at Yale University. Heard of it. 
He didn't dedicate it to Brett's. 1947. Do some of you have this book? The Glacial Theory? Actually, let's check the index. Contents. Channel scab lens, channel scab lens. Catastrophic floods, catastrophic floods. Huh. No catastrophic floods. Interesting. Okay. I think in the last show, Jerome pointed out that Brett's was very, uh, sorry, that Flint was very strong with glaciation, but very weak with interpreting flood deposits. What are we doing in this bulk? No dedication? Ouch, that had to hurt Brett's. Oh, thank you, Glenn. Yeah. So, okay, so there's stuff falling out of the Brett stuff. Here's something that was on the ground. I don't know if that looks like Flint's handwriting, to be honest. So if you joined us late, Thomas from Seattle drove over the pass, visited Bijou. He, was really, he really wanted to meet Bijou. And so Bijou took off his sunglasses and said, hey, how's it going? And put them back on, went back down stairs. But Thomas made a delivery of these documents that had been collecting dust on a shelf in the, at the University of Washington for 50 years. Probably. And uh, we're getting a chance to look them. They, they belong to Richard Foster Flint. And when Flint got them to Porter, or whether there was somebody in between those two, uh, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe John Stone knows the answer. So here's, I guess, the one that I shared with you. Let's get, let's get a little more detail here, get this down a little bit more. Yeah. So there's the 28 map. But they weren't working on S glowing loose mantle vertical jointed basalt. The ice stagnated, but a large wasting area. Consider post Spokane up warping. That son of a bitch, I hate... No, sorry, that's not what it says. The thickness of Spokane must deposition... Okay, I'm not making sense. I can't read. He's underlining a bunch of stuff. There's a lot of notes here. This is pretty sweet. These... These three miles from Brett's drift border actually west in the glaciated area and can be made from our agreement. Evidence question mark? Wow, fascinating. Okay. Let's let's keep going. We'll make a few discoveries together perhaps. Richard Foster Flint from sent by Bretts. Oh, Bretts did some piece on the origin of man. This is a trip down memory lane for us. These are these old papers that we've been studying, but in their original condition. Oh, so some kind of somebody at the U Dub kind of tried to organize these a little bit. So these bookmarks are. Interesting, okay. Wow. It's one thing that Flint owned these and jotted a couple notes here and there. This is the, I think this is one of the ones that Flint didn't have. And then, and then Brett said, I'll send it to you. You haven't even read all my stuff yet. But I like the part that these guys took a bunch of these things out in the field. For some reason, the fact that it's in a, backpack or a car trunk or something 
appeals to me even more. Meaning, question mark? Here's the ambush meeting. Let's see what he wrote here. Flint's like, I want to be in this. How can I get in this thing? How can I be a critic? Okay. Let's finish with the one where you guys all corrected me, which, which I appreciate. Yeah, here it is. Do you remember this one? Like a, a few episodes back, I'm like, well, here's Flint. And I said, why did he put an N up here? That doesn't make any sense. And you're all typing in the live chat. That's an IV, you dum-dum. Flint is putting in an IV alternative. The most important single paper, says Flint. So if it's the most important single paper, does he have any notes in this one? Yes, he does. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. What is distributing in the Plunge Basin, i.e. just south of Spokane or Columbia Rivers? Not impossible in normal streams. Interesting. Statement not truly quantitative. Does it require much water to wash away loose? Evidence? Where are these? Chamber Chandler Narrows. Ponded condition north of Wallula Gateway does not necessarily imply deep water on north part of Plateau. Where? <laughs> oh my God, this, this is a great, this is so great. This is Flint attacking this paper just in the margins. They're not attacking. Well, most of us do this sort of thing. Drift, shallow, stress, related to gateway, Wallula Gateway Ponding. Shallow material, stream build. Possible two stages of cutting, pre-Spokane and Spokane. Allison interprets ponding here by Bergs. You never know what's going to turn up. And that's one of the most fun things about a series like this. You just never know what's going to pop up. Thanks, everybody. I love you, and goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. I hope to see you Sunday morning live at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Goodbye.
Thanks once again to Vinman's Bakery. And thanks once again to Vinman's Bakery. You've got to love it. My favorites.